Can a soul, or the essence of an entity, become trapped inside of an object? Could one channeling enough energy, dedication, and care into something allow an otherworldly presence to possess it, attracting spirits, like moths, to a flame? We have covered haunted objects here before, such as Akiku the doll, among others. But this story is too infamous to not be given the time of day. And although it has been told many times, perhaps you will learn a detail or two that you've never heard before. This is the untold story of Robert the Doll and the malevolent monstrosity that stares at the world from behind its beady little eyes. At first glance, most people tend to agree that although dolls of all sorts can be creepy to say the least, there is something particularly unnerving about the doll that has become known to the world as Robert. But behind the initial feelings of unease at first glance lies many tales of accidents, tragedy, and misfortune, all supposedly at Robert's hands. Far too many within his presence to just be a string of awful coincidences. But if an evil force supposedly lives within the confines of this century-old child's toy, to come to recognize and understand just what it could be, we must first tell its story. And to tell Robert's story properly, we must first start at the very beginning. As with many legends, there are multiple versions of the origin story and how Robert the doll came to be. Having read through most, if not all of them, I'll be sharing with you the most agreed upon origin for accuracy's sake in the beginning, and we will explore other theories and origin stories later in this video. The year is 1904, and a man named Thomas Otto is on a trip in Germany. Whether it was for business or leisure, we can't say, but during his trip, he decided to pick up a gift for his young grandson's birthday to take back home with him to the States. As he perused various shops throughout his time there, he stumbled across a toy that he believed would be the perfect fit for the young boy. Perched on display behind a pale glass window sat a doll. The doll was about the size of a young child and was accompanied by a small dog doll as well. Knowing that his grandson was lonely on the large family estate and was very fond of dogs as well, Thomas believed he had found what he had been searching for and quickly purchased the toy. In due time, he would find his way back to the United States once his trip was over, bringing his precious cargo with him. Making his way back to the family estate located in Key West, Florida, to greet his family after months abroad, Thomas, in an act of innocence and excitement, gifted the toy to his grandson Eugene for his eighth birthday. As soon as Eugene laid eyes on the gift he had received, he became ecstatic. With no other children his own age in the home or nearby, he now for once had his very own friend, his own best friend, and one that could accompany him wherever he went. Sitting at around three feet tall with his little dog, Eugene named his new friend, Robert. But Robert of course needed clothes to fit for years of adventures to come. So Eugene's mother, Maria, quickly found just what he was missing. A small sailor's outfit that had once belonged to her son, but had long since been outgrown. After placing Robert in his new clothes, the two were off to play, and soon became inseparable. Wherever Eugene went, Robert accompanied him. From hours of play inside and outside of the house, to the dinner table, and bedtime, his new best friend was everything the young man wanted, and much more. Besides constant companionship, Eugene began to confide in the doll, often speaking to him as if he was a person in his own right. His parents, who were first just as elated as their young son was at his excitement over his new toy, began to grow concerned over how close their son was to the doll, but they would initially write off the behavior as most would, since lonely children with their imaginations still very much active will typically invent imaginary friends or adventurous stories to fill the void or lack of friends and real adventures 
within their daily lives. But over the months since Robert had arrived, they noticed a bizarre shift in Eugene's personality. He began to grow extremely possessive and obsessive over Robert and would lash out at his parents, sometimes violently, if the doll was not in his sight at all times. It would soon appear that Eugene's obsession with his cloth companion and shift in behavior wasn't the only strange activity that was taking place. One night, as she tucked her son into bed, Maria overheard Eugene whispering to Robert, something that at this point had become a daily occurrence. But as she closed the door to his room and began to walk away, she heard a deep, guttural voice respond to her son. Shocked and terrified, she rushed back into her son's room, only to find him laying with the doll, as per usual. When she asked him just who was speaking, he simply answered, Robert. This scary happening wouldn't be the last. About a year into Robert the doll inhabiting their Key West estate, the Autos noticed yet another shift in their son's behavior. But this time, it was almost the exact opposite of what the initial shift had been. Eugene had gone from a quiet and shy but charming young man to a belligerent, angry, and possessive boy. But now, he had become one that was meek, full of anxiety, and constantly seemed like he was walking on eggshells. He had now also taken to violent fits on occasion, as if something was trying to overtake his body and soul. The guttural voice that Maria had heard a year ago could be heard much more frequently now, and just as frequently, almost nightly, it became commonplace to hear what sounded like glass breaking and constant commotion coming from Eugene's room. Upon hearing the turmoil, his parents would rush to discover the source. Upon opening their son's door, they would find his furniture dumped upside down. Other toys of his would be smashed or in pieces. And Eugene would almost always be in the corner of the room in his bed petrified, while Robert the doll would be in his usual space, nearby. Upon asking just what had happened, they would be met with an all too familiar answer at this point. They would ask, just who did this Eugene? And his answer would always be, Robert. Noticing the activity becoming more and more intense, and being a God-fearing woman herself, Maria was deeply disturbed by what was taking place in her home and what was taking place to her family, particularly her son. Besides the nightly terror that now plagued them, she was very much disturbed by this guttural voice that she kept hearing. Knowing that her son had not yet matured, she knew that there was no way his voice could reach that deep level of tonality and malice that she often heard. At times, the voice would even shout and speak over Eugene, and unless he was exceptionally good at ventriloquism, something was horrifically wrong. It was as if the devil himself now occupied the walls of their home. Like a stain or a liquid, the presence had slowly seeped in and permeated throughout their lives. One night, as per usual, the family settles down to sleep. As the clouds spiral and the moon now haunts the sky above them, gleaming down overhead, the family's peace is shattered by the horrific screams of their son and the echoes of the sounds of things being broken. Wide-eyed and terrified, Eugene's parents rush to their son's aid. Lantern in hand, the closer they get to his room, the louder the low and horrible voice becomes and the louder the screams of Eugene become as well. The deep voice that had been growing louder suddenly was silent like the winter snow as hands touched the doorknob. Quickly overcoming their fear for the sake of their boy, the couple throw the door open to find their son huddled underneath his sheets. His room was almost completely destroyed. Most of his belongings were in pieces or tatters from what was left of his toys 
to his furniture, to even his clothes. Poor Eugene was shaking in the corner of his room, opposite his bed, and Robert, along with his beady-eyed companion, were in his bed, staring at them all, silently. By this point, Maria knew that whatever Robert was, or whatever inhabited him, was truly evil. But unsure of how to handle the situation, or what exactly they were dealing with, in a fit of rage, she grabbed the doll and rushed to the attic, casting Robert and his canine companion into the darkness above. This would remain his home until a better idea presented itself as to what to do with him. The low groans and screams and breaking ceased in Eugene's room, but would frequently be heard in the attic. With having such a large estate to care for, the family did have a team of servants to care for the property, but their loyal crew, having experienced the strangeness themselves, up and quit. The servants soon became a revolving door, with new faces almost always coming and going just as quickly as they started. Despite his banishment to the attic, alongside the occasional crashing sounds and yelling, the family said that they would also hear Robert walking around, the pitter-patter of his small feet often being heard, echoing all throughout the house, especially at night, when he seemed to truly come alive, so to speak. As the years passed, and despite all of the childhood trauma and fear inflicted on him by the demonic doll, unbeknownst to any rational mind, after his parents' passing, Eugene would choose to take Robert back into his possession as an adult. Perhaps he did this to ensure that Robert wouldn't inflict terror upon anyone else. Maybe he felt like he had the most experience dealing with him, and therefore he was the most equipped to handle anything that could possibly happen as a result of his presence. Eugene in his adult years became an artist, and would later marry and have a family of his own. He kept Robert propped up in the window of his art studio, known as the turret room, which overlooked his front yard. Annette, Eugene's wife, was said to disapprove of Robert's presence in the house, and demanded that he be gotten rid of, or banished into the attic or basement. For a short time this took place, but naturally, Robert didn't take kindly to this, and apparently began to make threats towards her by visiting her in her dreams, and verbally telling Eugene that if he was not moved back, horrible things would happen to his family. So eventually, Robert was placed back in the turret room. Aside from this, I couldn't find any additional information on the happenings that took place during those years inside the home. I would hope and imagine that perhaps Robert had gone dormant during this time, especially since Eugene did eventually have children of his own and hopefully didn't allow them to be compromised by having such a thing in the house. There were, however, reports of passerbys, school children and neighbors, feeling a strange presence when passing by the house on a daily basis. Others would say that they could see Robert move, but in the blink of an eye, he would be back to where he was sitting. Eugene Otto would continue to spend the rest of his life painting in the turret room with Robert the Doll until his death in 1974. However, this bizarre legend does not stop with his death. Upon Eugene's passing, his family sold the house to a woman named Myrtle Reuter. Upon moving into the home, she noticed, sitting in the window of the turret room, was a small doll with a sailor's uniform. She thought this to be strange, since the Otto family had not left any other belongings behind when they had moved. But regardless, she decided to keep it. Myrtle soon began to realize that there was something different about this doll. Upon house cleaning, she would typically notice that he moved around the room, seemingly by himself. At night, she would hear what she described as small footsteps all throughout the house. Guests who would visit her claimed too that Robert would move of his own volition and that his blank expression would change to one of rage if anyone discussed him in a negative way. 
Myrtle would eventually reach out and speak with the widowed Annette Otto, who would confirm her worst fears, that something otherworldly inhabited Robert the Doll. After dealing with his antics for years, she finally decided to reach out to a local museum and would donate Robert in 1994 to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, where he remains today. But as with each previous relocation, his story does not end here either. Placed inside his own glass display for the public to see him each and every day, one would think that perhaps Robert's antics would cease. He was of course a natural source of curiosity and would be seen and admired by many people daily, but you would be very wrong. Staff at the museum have claimed to find Robert in various positions within his case, as if he was attempting to break out of it, or had been out of it prior, and had just re-entered it. The Phantom Footsteps, as previously claimed by all three families, has also been reported, as well as the doll's expression changing from neutral to nasty in an instant. The afflictions first started with the staff themselves, from horrible bouts of rare diseases to relationship breakdowns and marriage failures, as well as unique instances of psychosis. Over the years, the curse of Robert the Doll began to take shape and become a well-known phenomena, but it would soon spread to many others besides the staff themselves. Many people, upon visiting Robert's exhibit, finding him strange to say the least, would often mock him, berate him, or just laugh at his appearance. Little did they know that they would be inviting the wrath of something otherworldly. Shortly after their visit, droves of people began to experience shockingly similar happenings to that of the staff, varying in intensity, almost as if their punishment was being tapered to fit their crimes. From less serious experiences, like paranormal activity beginning in their home, horrible luck, and job loss to name a few, to much more serious experiences, like exotic disease diagnosis, rare cancers, relationship disintegration, and others, car accidents, falls, and even untimely death. Eventually, a warning would be added to Robert's exhibit, explaining the alleged curse and the proper etiquette to approach him with, whether that's to observe or take a photo, as to not offend whoever or whatever inhabits the doll itself. Over the decades, an entire wall has been dedicated to the letters people have dropped off or sent the museum if they weren't able to come in person begging for Robert's forgiveness, hoping to end whatever horrible situation they found themselves in after their visit. To this day, there are over a thousand letters, with more continuing to be added each and every year. But could there be more to this legend? As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there is another origin story that could explain just what inhabits the doll and how it got there. I will also add several elements that I found interesting relating to the case itself. The alternative origin story says that a young woman of Bahamian descent gave Thomas Otto the doll as a retaliation for a misdeed. As to why this would have taken place is not known, but speculation has led many to believe that the girl or perhaps a relative had been a member of staff at some point or another at the family's Key West estate. The retaliation was that the doll had been imbued with a spirit that had been conjured using voodoo, and by trapping the entity within the doll, making it its vessel, it became aware of its surroundings and knew what it was sent there to do. Although with many details in this case, lots of details can't be corroborated due to the age of the story itself, but there are a few details that I managed to dig up that are interesting. The doll itself appears to have been manufactured by the Steiff Company, a German family company that was headed by German designer Richard Steiff, the original designer of the beloved teddy bear. And the original design of the doll in particular 
and others that were similar to it were not designed as toys, but rather stage props for the time. So it's hard to say if Robert was ever intended as a toy in the first place. The family tree of the Autos also has conflicting information in regards to birth and death dates, as well as names. But I did my best to corroborate this information, and I'll be linking the info in the description below. Today, Robert continues to be on display, and his antics continue to persist. He seems to be just as powerful as he was all those years ago. The museum keeps a cataloged record of all ailments that have been reported as a result of offending him for future reference. His reach also continues to expand as his legend grows and becomes more and more well known across the world. Robert the Doll has been the inspiration behind many books, movies, and podcasts, as well as a local legend in Florida. And this lesson truly applies to anyone and everyone. Have respect when you meet someone, because you never truly know who or what you could be dealing with. And please, if you find yourself at the East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, and you happen to come into contact with the entity known as Robert the Doll, be respectful, because if you're not, you may just pay the ultimate price. They say that one man's trash is another man's treasure. While many people accidentally purchase a haunted home without knowing it was haunted, this story partially is about a man who did the opposite. But the home in which he purchased was way more than he bargained for. Not for him, but for a family whose experiences made it infamous. With a one-of-a-kind strange past and a present day nasty and demonic reputation. Known as Pennsylvania's Amityville Horror, this is the untold story of the Wells House and why it's considered one of the most haunted places in the state, let alone the country. To properly tell this story, we must first start at the beginning. The notorious home on Wells Street was built by industrialist Augustus C. Laning, but despite his future success, Laning had not led such an easy life. After arriving in the Wilkes-Barre area to work for his grandfather at age 14, he would soon experience tragedy. His younger nephew shortly after his arrival would pass away when the barn he was playing in was struck by lightning and caught fire, trapping him inside. Shortly after this happening, one of his grandfather's factories would also mysteriously catch fire and burn to the ground as well. Despite a series of unfortunate events, the Laning's enterprises would eventually thrive, allowing Augustus to inherit land from his mother on what is today Well Street. Eventually, he would build a home at 46 South Well Street in 1861 and lived there until 1865, when he eventually sold his home and business. He would take his last breath in 1875. The land in which Laning built the home on, as many locals would say, was soaked in turmoil and blood. Having been the site of numerous wars and conflicts between Native American tribes, as well as European settlers and Native tribes. From the late 19th century to the mid 20th century, the house went through a series of sheriff sales, which were a type of public auction, and would eventually sell for just one dollar at auction in May of 1939, a little over twenty dollars in today's money. Although tragedy befell the Laning family, especially early on in Augustus's life, any happenings within the home weren't documented if they did occur. As far as we know, no death had taken place up until this time, but it certainly starts to snowball as the years progress. In 1940, the person who had purchased the home so cheaply at auction would breathe their last breath by their own hand, as would the next person who purchased the home via auction in 1950, almost exactly 10 years apart to the day. 
After these mysterious deaths, there would be four more that would take place on the premises. The other three I was unable to dig up additional details on. However, the most notable was the fourth. A priest who was 54 years old and in relatively good health had been walking past the home in passing. When he glanced at the home, we don't know exactly what he saw or experienced, but he fell to the ground and died almost instantly from a heart attack right in the front yard. The home would be a revolving door for quite some time, sometimes vacant, sometimes with occupants, but only for a short time. In March of 1975, a 27-year-old radio DJ by the name of Walker Bennett and his wife Mary Ann purchased the home and then moved into the house from New Haven with their two daughters. Almost as soon as they moved into the house, bizarre activity began to manifest. The family began to hear banging and scratching sounds coming from inside the walls. Thinking at first they had some kind of a rodent problem, Walker followed the noise and traced it back to a particular bedroom wall. He then knocked the wall down, but instead of being greeted by this supposed rodent problem, he instead saw a small, glimmering tin box instead. After removing the box, he felt a strange presence. Upon opening it, its contents were very weird to say the least. It contained a red ribbon, a cross made of tied together chicken bones, and a human molar. The first thing that struck him was that this looked like some kind of a hex or curse, but not wanting to alarm his family, he would dispose of the items, but the activity nonetheless would continue to persist. By 1976, the scratching and knocking had continued, but soon the family began to see otherworldly beings as well. On one particularly cold February morning, Bennett would hear a series of bangs and scratches on his front door. Upon slowly opening it to see just who was there, he would be shocked. Standing at the front door was the translucent figure of a man with a cane with a vicious and crooked smile. Freaked out with his heart racing, he quickly slammed the door and tried to make sense of the interaction. Within seconds, he reopened the door, only to find that there was nothing there. As the days ticked by, the activity intensified. The scratches and banging noises now seemed to be originating from the attic. They now were also joined by disembodied screams some seeming to be male, others female, and some were a mix of both. In the months to come, the activity would be coupled with moaning and groaning sounds, whispering voices, and the sounds of weeping coming from inside the walls, all still tracing back to the attic. Coupled with these new developments were the sounds of heavy footsteps on the wooden floors, the entire family would also see several apparitions. Notably, they would experience the ghostly figure of a young woman in a nightdress drifting throughout the house. Her dress seemed to be old, like those of the Victorian era. Whenever she was seen, following her would be drips or spots of blood, either on the floor or on the walls. Once she began to be seen, there was a putrid, rotting type of stench that became present in the house, traveling from room to room. It was, however, usually the worst in the kitchen and living room. Not wanting to further frighten the girls, the Bennets met with each other to discuss all of the bizarre happenings, and they finally had to admit that they had purchased a haunted house. Haunted by what exactly? They couldn't be sure. Shortly after this revelation, the family began to suffer from an unexplainable physical illness, one that left them drained at all times, exhausted and aching. The doctors couldn't diagnose it, leaving the family only to continue to suffer with the symptoms. Alongside this, whether it was a result of the illness on an individual basis or the haunting itself, 
the whole family seemed to be thrown into a deep, dark well of depression, submerged in its black waters, leaving them feeling hopeless. Things would begin to escalate further when in January of 1977, Walker and his wife would witness one of their daughters be pushed down the stairs. But to their amazement, she didn't fall and crumple on the various steps. Instead, she floated, almost in slow motion, until she landed on her feet at the bottom of them, unharmed. Not knowing what to make of this, the adults in the house weren't getting much sleep, and their condition continued to get worse. They would soon reach out to the church for help and guidance. Soon a Catholic priest would come out and bless the home, trying to quell whatever supernatural forces that were wreaking havoc upon the Bennets. But these efforts were to no avail. If anything, after he left, the activity seemed to get worse. Ultimately, in March of 1978, the family who had been sound asleep in the night was woken up by the sound of thunder crashing, except there wasn't a storm outside. What followed this massive sound was a deluge of paranormal manifestations. Footsteps were pounding across the floor and in the attic above them. The attic door was being pounded on from the other side. Their dishes in their kitchen were being removed from their cabinets as they opened and slammed by themselves and thrown onto the floor, shattering them. Amongst the chaos was the scratching and banging on the front door, coupled with the sounds of a child weeping coming from inside of the walls, following them as they ran throughout the house. After enduring almost three years inside the home, the Bennets finally fled this night, leaving with just the clothes on their backs. They left all of their belongings behind. After the family found temporary arrangements, they immediately tried to sell the home as it was, but had no luck finding a buyer. After several months, Walker Bennett reached out to a local newspaper in hopes of sharing the family's story anonymously to find help or a buyer to get them out of this haunted hell. In the interview under the pseudonym of Bucky Johnson, he claimed that he was now $40,000 in debt as a result of the family fleeing and being unable to live in the house and then being unable to sell the house and that he had developed a drinking problem and now chain smoked as a result of the trauma and stress that he had endured. He also stated that he and the rest of the family were in therapy in hopes of eventually putting the past behind them. Several neighbors near the home were also interviewed, with some saying that they had never seen or heard anything, and others saying that they always had an odd feeling whenever passing by the house. The article was then published on Halloween of 1979, perfect timing for a local and terrifying story, no doubt. Following the initial publicity, word eventually made its way to Ed and Lorraine Warren, famed paranormal investigators and demonologists who had just covered another haunting known as the Amityville Horror just three years before. The couple made a visit to the Wells Street house in March of 1980, but by this time, the bank had repossessed the home from the Bennets due to their inability to make further mortgage payments on the home. So the Warrens were unable to enter the house due to it being entirely locked up for this reason. Lorraine, however, would say that she sensed a terrible despair emanating from the house, and that the effect it must have had on those who lived there must have been very negative. Several years later, the house would be purchased by a woman named Catherine Watkins from the bank for $20,000 in August of 1982. Her purchase subsequently prompted another newspaper article to be written, when asked, she told reporters that she was unafraid of the rumors surrounding the house and didn't fear any ghosts that could be there. She moved in with her two children shortly after her purchase. And whether it was sheer determination, stubborn nature, or something else, she lived in the house for the next 30 years 
until her death on October 26th of 2012. Although shortly after moving in and over the decades to come, she and her family also experienced unexplained phenomena, such as objects moving by themselves, their beds shaking, lights and appliances turning on and off by themselves, and seeing those ghosts that Catherine insisted she wasn't afraid of such as the woman in what looked like Victorian-style clothing. Her daughter would inherit the home after Catherine's passing and would place the home up for sale, where it was then purchased by a ghost hunter by the name of Tim Woods in December of 2013. Rather than repair, sell, or live in the property he had just purchased, Woods only wanted to investigate the paranormal activity that was taking place there. With his team of fellow investigators, they would record hours of content in the home and capture what they believed to be numerous supernatural manifestations. People who have joined him in the investigations have been known to have scratches manifest on their skin and have their clothing tugged on by unseen hands. Tim would later state that the Wells House is one of the scariest haunted locations that he had ever investigated due to the numerous ghost sightings that were caught on tape and demonic attacks that occurred while he was there. He said, It is our conclusion based upon our documented research that the house is haunted by a demonic presence that cannot be removed, nor is it safe for anyone to live in. The strangeness of the house on Wells Street doesn't end here. In the early hours of Wednesday, July 25th of 2018, police were called to the home to catch an intruder. Someone was outside of the house, trying to get in. When authorities arrived, they apprehended a man in his 30s. He was caught in the act of prying the wooden boards off the back door of the property. He had a 24-inch sword tied to his back, had brass knuckles, and a pocket knife in his pockets and was carrying a Bible. The man seemed out of it to say the least, but claimed that he was trying to hunt for ghosts. Upon going through his rucksack, police also found a loaded shotgun with 10 shells alongside of it. He would be arrested and charged with numerous offenses as a result of the episode. Although we don't know who, it seems that the home was sold in 2020 to new owners and at half the price that Woods had paid for it. There also doesn't appear to be any sort of a mention of it being haunted. Its listing reads like this. A home full of historical intrigue. With some TLC, you can bring new life to this four-bedroom beauty. As soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there is truly something out of this world with this home and its craftsmanship. A very fitting spin, if you ask me. I hope the new occupants are living peacefully, although given the home's infamous story and past, seems highly unlikely. But the listing was right about one thing, though. The home certainly has lots of historical intrigue. And you can bring new life into this four-bedroom beauty. Because as soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there's truly something out of this world with this home. Or should we say, in this home, that's been watching and waiting for some new life to engorge itself on. Could an item, if given enough energy, devotion, and focus, begin to take on a life of its own? Could it begin to exhibit human-like characteristics, as if it has been imbued with or contains some kind of soul or entity inside of it? This act of magic has been practiced by multiple religions and cults throughout the ages. This is just one very strange example that it could indeed be possible. After a gracious gift was placed into the arms of a little girl, tragedy would strike, and what follows would continue to haunt the family, the citizens of the village, and would soon cross far beyond the barriers of land and sea. This is the untold story of Akiku, the haunted Japanese doll, and the bizarre paranormal force that possessed it.
Japan is a very mystical and spiritual place. A place where the souls of the past seem to interact with the living. Such places where this spiritual energy seems to be most visible is throughout many of Japan's spiritual temples. Home to many religions, the two main ones being Buddhism and Shintoism, thousands of temples exist all over the country. But one in particular houses a spiritual artifact that has a tragic backstory and an even more terrifying story that continues to be written to this day. Located in Hokkaido, Japan, at the Meninji Buddhist Temple, is a doll with a bizarre and tragic backstory indeed. Although there are several origin stories of how the doll came to be and how the temple became its final living space, so to speak, all of them have most of the main details in common. Therefore, I'll be telling the most agreed upon origin story to try and be as true to the legend as I can. The year is 1918 in Hokkaido, Japan, and a 17-year-old boy by the name of Ikigi Suzuki is in search of a gift for his little sister's birthday. As he pursues the different vendors and small shops, something soon catches his attention. In one of the store windows, he spots a small, childlike doll wearing a traditional Japanese kimono. Knowing that he had finally found something his sister will love, Ikiki quickly purchases the doll and makes his way back home through the countryside. As the family celebrates their little girl's birthday, Okiku is presented with the doll, and almost immediately, as soon as her eyes meet hers, she falls in love with him. The two from this point become inseparable. Wherever Okiku is, her doll is right by her side. She combs her hair, bathes her, dresses her, and treats her as if she was her little sister. The two even share meals and sleep side by side. The joy that the doll brought Okiku must have filled Ekiki's heart with such happiness, but soon that happiness would change to tragedy. One hot day, as the little girl played outside with her doll, she was bitten by a mosquito. This benign insect bite would soon manifest itself into a horrible case of malaria. Although the family did everything they could possibly do, Okiku would pass away, scared and gasping for air as she clutched her special doll all the way until the moment she took her last breath. Devastated, the Suzuki's planned to have their little girl buried with the doll since she loved it so much, but unfortunately, due to either governmental or religious oversight at the time, this wasn't an option. Instead, after they had laid Okiku to rest, the doll would be placed on a small family shrine located within the living quarters of their home as a tribute of sorts to their late daughter and their love for her. But shortly after the doll was placed on the shrine, very strange things began to happen. Ikiki, upon walking past the shrine one day, noticed that the doll's hair seemed significantly longer than what it had been when it was placed there. The hair, which was originally shoulder's length on the doll itself, and black, was now overgrown, with differing shades of brown hair also coming through and splitting at the ends. Finding this bizarre to say the least, he brought the discovery to his parents' attention, and unsure of what else to do, they trimmed the doll's hair. As the days came and went, the family began to have distressing dreams at night of their departed Okiku. Sometimes she would be scared and alone in the darkness, calling out to them, only being recognized by her voice. Other times, she would blame them for what happened to her. Each member of the family at differing times had these dreams, and they would soon lead all of them to believe that Akiku's soul wasn't peacefully resting. These disturbing dreams soon became all the stranger when the doll, which they began to refer to as a Kiku in their daughter's honor, would appear by their bedsides following these nightmares. One such incident involved the father of the family waking up in a cold sweat, only to be met face to face 
with the blank and lifeless stare of the doll. Unsure of what was taking place, the Suzukis turned to their faith. After contacting a local Buddhist priest and having a cleansing ritual be performed on their home and the doll, the activity seemed to grow and become stronger. Accompanying their ever-frequent nightmares and random movements of the doll, the chilling events grew into full-blown spiritual manifestations. During their waking life, they soon began to hear banging noises all throughout the house and the whispers of a little girl. Strange disembodied voices, varying from high-pitched, like those of a child, to the low groans of something unexplainable, began to be heard. Their lights began to flicker on and off, and the paranormal activity seemed to happen more frequently as the calendar ticked closer to the birth and death dates of Akiku. These strange and terrifying happenings would continue over the course of the next 20 years, with multiple religious priests and shamans being contacted, and all coming to the same conclusion that after the cleansings failed time and time again, that the restless spirit of Akiku now inhabited the doll she once loved so much. Finally, needing a major change, and unable to deal with the ever-intensifying spiritual presence that seemed to haunt their home, the Suzukis relocated to a different district. Believing the doll to be the source of their various ailments and emotional torture that they had endured over the last two decades, they had no desire to take it with them. The family had reached the conclusion that if their daughter's soul wasn't at peace, what could perhaps be helping to fuel Okiku's power or magic was the close proximity of her grave to their home where the doll resided. So in order to distance the doll from the grave, the family approached the Menenji Buddhist temple in Hokkaido, and over the years, the doll's reputation for being haunted had spread throughout the community and indeed the majority of the country. This was more than likely due to the various interactions between the spiritual community and the Suzuki family. Finding the doll to be mesmerizing and possibly a unique opportunity to commute and interact with the dead if the stories were true, the leaders and priests of the Meninji Temple agreed to home Okiku permanently. As with many legends, we find lots of details to be exaggerated over time, and perhaps some of the details to not be true at all. And this is what the priests were originally thinking, that perhaps due to grief, the family was dealing with other spiritual ailments, perhaps unrelated to the doll, or causing the doll to be a vessel of sorts for restless spirits. However, as the years came and went, as Akiku now called the temple her home, they began to slowly but surely experience the same strangeness the Suzuki's had for all of those years. Akiku's hair continued to grow, and this baffled the priests. They would eventually have the hair trimmed and tested, and the hair was said to belong to a little girl. They found that the entity seemed to be appeased when her hair was trimmed and combed, and this led to less activity for a time, but the same activity, the knocking, banging, and disembodied voices, would soon plague the temple as well, and Okiku's power only seemed to grow. Any priest who seemed skeptical of the doll or attempted to cleanse it themselves soon had their dreams haunted as well, turning their sleep into restless fits. Their homes and rooms soon also began to manifest the very same activity that the temple was now exhibiting. With no remedy seeming to work, the leaders turned to appeasement instead, hoping that gestures of goodwill would keep the entity at bay. As years turn to decades, and as we've come into the 21st century, the priests of multiple generations now have overseen and cared for the doll known as Akiku. And though some of the more violent activity has faded, the general consensus is that she is now just as powerful as she was, or is perhaps more powerful as she's continued to age. It seems like as the more her fame and notoriety grows, the more visitors she has, the stronger she becomes. 
She continues to invade the dreams of those who come to visit her, and her hair is growing faster and more frayed. She is said to drive tourists mad who doubt her, with many people even reporting that besides seeing her strange hair and feeling a malevolent presence when visiting her, they've also had her stalk and appear in their dreams. Some more disturbing and recent reports have even suggested that her mouth is slowly opening and that if you dare to peer inside of it, you may just catch a glimpse of baby-like teeth sprouting from her porcelain gums, as if whoever or whatever she is is slowly turning to flesh and bone. The paranormal displays of her power continue to occur as well. Her permanent home located within the Menijin Temple is her own private shrine where she sits in a small wooden box on display. It is here that she watches and waits for anyone and everyone who dares to play with fire and invoke the power of the entity known as Okiku. But what are your thoughts? Was Okiku the girl trapped inside of the doll? In my opinion, Although her spirit would be much older now, at the time of her death, she was either close to or was three years old, and no person at that age is capable of true malice, to the point to where she would become aware enough to begin to blame her parents and then torment them for decades to come. As children, our parents or our family are our entire world, so I find it incredibly difficult to think that these bizarre happenings were the result of her soul being restless and imbuing the doll. What I find more likely, and all the more interesting really, is the thought of invocation or the imbuing of the doll, like a conduit or a vessel of sorts. Akiku the girl was, as they said, inseparable from this doll. She fed it, bathed it, took naps with it, and everything else a small child would do with that wonderful imagination that they have. But could all of this dedication and focus, accompanied with the tragedy that took place, allow for a portal to open for an entity, whether non-human or a restless human spirit, to inhabit the doll? And by non-human, I mean a demon. This would make sense to me. Something that enjoys and grows more powerful off of pain and misfortune, or the emotional torment of others. As it causes the pain, it feeds off of it and grows ever stronger. This would not only explain the malevolent manifestations of whatever entity is present, but would also explain the still present force and the alleged ever growing power of it. And depending on the entity's strength, it could also explain why the cleansings thus far have failed. However, if you find yourself taking a trip to Japan anytime soon, or you happen to call Japan home, if you find yourself in Hokkaido, you may want to steer clear of the Menijin Temple, because if you don't, the entity that inhabits the doll known as Okiku may just use you as its next feeding source, where it'll begin to plague your dreams, making you twist and turn, sweat and fear, as it grows ever stronger and attempts to cross from its world into ours making our plane of existence its permanent residence. After a flood destroys their home, a family is forced to relocate to a new home, which they believe is going to be a fresh start for them. However, it turns out to be a fresh new hell instead. From demonic attacks, nightmarish visuals, and terrifying manifestations, this is one haunting story you won't want to miss. This is the untold story of the Smurl haunting in Pennsylvania and the monstrous creature that stalked its walls. The timeline of events is rough at best, but I have done my best to make the most coherent retelling of the story, so please keep that in mind. Raging floods as a result of Hurricane Agnes have destroyed the homes of many families, and one such family was the Smurls. The Smurl family consisted of Janet and Jack Smurl and their four young children, 
Heather, Shannon, Karen, and Dawn. With their home destroyed in the Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania area, feeling as if they had been uprooted and tossed about like the rushing waters that took their house, the Smurls decide to temporarily relocate to West Pitson, where Jack's parents currently lived. After explaining the situation and staying with the couple for a short time, they were surprised and ultimately blessed when Jack's parents proposed an idea to them. They had found an old duplex, a bit of a fixer-upper, also in West Pitson. The two of them could live on one side, and Jack, Janet, and the kids on the other. That way, they could look out for one another, and of course spend more time together. Not in a position to, or wanting to say no, Jack and Janet humbly accepted their offer. But all too soon, they would be confronted with the question, was this blessing truly a curse? With Jack's parents paying for them all to move into the new house, they soon find themselves rehomed and living in the newly purchased duplex. Located on Chase Street there in West Pitson, although the home would need some work, the neighborhood seemed friendly and inviting, a good place to raise a family. The family collectively puts their efforts into repainting, retooling, and other repairs, but in no time, the slightly run-down home was feeling fresh, vibrant, and modern, making the Smurls feel ever more at home and hopeful for the future. However, this would not last forever, for it seemed that each time they banged a hammer, each time they drove a nail into a wall, and with every drop of paint, they woke something up within the house itself. Something that perhaps had been slumbering there for quite some time. During this time, small episodes of strangeness began to manifest. Seeming rather benign at first, tools began to disappear only to reappear hours later in different spots. Old stains that covered the walls began to seep through the fresh coats of paint, and several appliances in their kitchen had mysteriously caught fire even though they were unplugged. Along with these oddities, the family would also begin to smell awful odors that overwhelmed the entire house, like an omnipresent floating cloud of rotting meat that hung over them, only to disperse mere moments later after being detected. But despite these weird events, the family didn't really think much of it. They were just thankful to have a roof over their heads. Jack and Janet continued to rebuild their lives. Jack, fortunately, had since gotten a better job than the one he had had previously and was promoted during this time. He was also able to coach his daughter's softball team. The children had reacclimated to a new school and were getting good grades and Janet had become pregnant with baby number five and also helped organize an anti-drunk driving group at the local high school. And Jack's parents were doing great as well. But all of this positivity, unfortunately, would not last. By 1974, things began to change for the Smurls. It began when Mary Smurl, Jack's mother, suffered a heart attack. This led to the entire family struggling to make ends meet, and whether it was a result of the renovations or something else, something paranormal had began to manifest and make itself known. It began when Janet began to hear the voice of her mother-in-law, who shortly after her heart attack was now at home and recovering. Doing what she could to help her, she would hear her name being called out from Mary and would rush to her aid to help her with anything and everything that she could possibly need. But the strange thing was, Mary at times would either be unconscious, sleeping, or wouldn't have had called for her at all. Attributing this bizarre phenomenon to stress at first, she writes it off. However, Mary soon starts experiencing her own strangeness. She too, as if the words had come from Janet's mouth herself, would hear her name being called. Only when confronted, Janet would have no idea what she was talking about. But that wasn't all, of course. 
The stains that had previously been painted over and were thought to be covered began to seep through yet again, and new stains began to appear as well, with several appearing on the hardwood floors of the home. As the days progressed, the oldest small child soon began to experience the presence as well. She would often be woken up in the dead of night, frozen with fear and unable to move. She would see translucent figures standing above her or at the edge of her bed, staring and watching her. And although it wasn't exclusive to the midnight hour, the activity seemed to pick up at night. Often, when Jack was at work or gone, Janet began to have violent, and sickening encounters with a being that she couldn't see. She began to be molested by an unseen force. These interactions left her hysterical, feeling violated and unclean. Trying to come to terms with what was happening to them, the family's luck continued to worsen. Additional appliances, including a TV set, went up in flames causing smoke and fire damage to the home on several occasions. And unlike the TV, the other appliances were not plugged in in order for the family to save money, which makes it all the more mysterious. On top of this, several water pipes which were fairly new after the family had initially renovated the home began to leak, not only causing water damage to the house, but adding to their financial woes as well. The string of bad luck would continue for the Smurls, and by 1977, the activity in the home became much more aggressive. The family's radio began to turn itself on and off, typically at strange hours, and almost always when the family was trying to sleep. The sinks in their bathrooms began to turn themselves on, pouring what little money they had left literally down the drain, and their toilets began to flush by themselves. Along with this activity, the sounds of footsteps began to be heard all throughout the house, and even on the insides of the walls. Drawers began to open and close by themselves, and coupled with these happenings was again the stench of rotting meat, what the family would begin to describe as the dead smell except instead of dissipating almost as soon as it was detected before or in one particular area of the house. The smell would permeate all throughout the house and would linger for minutes or sometimes even hours. Up until this point, besides seeing things being moved, dealing with the stains, pipes, and appliances, Jack hadn't been targeted, so to speak, by whatever paranormal force that was now fully awake within the Smurl residence. But one night, when he was trying to get some sleep after a long day's work, his side of the sheets were pulled from his body, and the sensation of dozens of hands touching and grabbing him ensured that not only was he not going to get the rest that night due to sheer terror, but that perhaps his wife had been telling the truth. Janet, shortly after moving into the house, had become pregnant, and this time had given birth to two baby girls, expanding the Smurl family to six children. Shortly after the twins were brought home, it seemed like whatever presence that had been woken up was making itself known. It became more aggressive, more vindictive, as if it was jealous or hated the living. One morning, while the majority of the children were at school and napping, and the rest of the adults were out, Janet was headed to the kitchen to pour herself a freshly brewed cup of coffee. As she turned around the corner, her blood ran cold. Standing in the middle of the kitchen, with a stain seeming to materialize directly underneath it, it was a translucent figure with hollow eyes. Frozen in place upon seeing it, it was as if she blinked and whatever this creature was, was gone. Was this what was responsible for the multitude of paranormal happenings within their house? As time progressed, Janet again would continue to hear her name being called out when no one else was there, over 
and over and over again. Strangely, as it was before in the beginning, the voices would often sound like her mother-in-law Mary, and even after double or triple checking sometimes to make sure she wasn't losing her mind, Mary would be nowhere to be found. Janet truly was alone. Other strange things that were heard during this time would be heard from the other side of the duplex. Couples do argue, and some fight. That just tends to happen to most, unfortunately. But these fights were something else. Jack's parents began to hear yelling and screaming, sometimes even items breaking, coming from the other side of the duplex, where Jack and Janet lived. These fights became so violent that not only did they think their marriage was collapsing, but they began to become concerned for Janet and the children's safety. One night, Jack's father couldn't take it anymore. He walked from their front door to the other side, and with the fight still raging, he threw the door open, only to be greeted with silence. The entire family was asleep. Not knowing what to make of this discovery, he simply left, bewildered. But the supposed audio of the fights would continue. Shortly after the bizarre discovery, Mary would experience something that almost gave her another heart attack. One evening, while her husband was still at work and she was alone on their side of the duplex, she began to hear her name being whispered and it sounded like Janet, but it was right within earshot or several feet of where she had been. Weirded out as most of us would be, she began to make her way towards the voice that was calling out to her, and that's when she saw it, standing in her living room with a stain seeping underneath its feet, was the same translucent being that Janet had claimed she had seen just a short while ago. And terrifyingly, its mouth was mimicking Janet's voice and calling out her name. Frozen in terror at first, with her heart racing, Mary ran to the door, exited, and immediately went into Jack and Janet's door, absolutely petrified with fear. The talks that followed this event in particular is what led to most of the individual experiences being laid out in the open. For everyone to know, and they would all come to the realization that whatever force that was in their house was not friendly. Shannon Smurl, who was only seven years old during this time, would be the next target. One day, as she casually walked through the kitchen and into the dining room, a large glass light fixture fell and crashed into her, cutting her and raising the alarm bells for the entire house. Again, it seemed like the paranormal being or force hated life, and now was possibly trying to end it if the opportunity presented itself. Scared but strapped for cash, they were all seemingly stuck in what was supposed to be their fresh start, but instead at this point was becoming their fresh hell. Shannon would continue to experience strangeness of her own as well, and her diary and later she would recount that oftentimes she would wake up and find herself floating above her bed, literally levitating several feet above her bed. Some nights, while floating, she would suddenly be thrown across the room and into a wall with so much force that she thought she would be crushed. The climax of these attacks on Shannon happened one night when she woke up to find herself floating once again. But instead of being let back down or smacked into a nearby wall, her door was flung open and she was thrown out of her room and down the stairs. Her parents heard this happen and rushed towards the screams of their little girl to find her absolutely hysterical and in pain. Fortunately, however, she would be okay physically after this event in particular. Another unfortunate soul that would be targeted in the Smurl duplex was the family's German shepherd, Simon. Simon would be found floating in the air, confused and concerned. 
And this new development and activity was not just exclusive to Shannon or their beloved dog. Alongside the intensified attacks on Janet, she too would begin finding herself woken up in the middle of the night, floating in the air, and sometimes, horrifically, without control of her body, she would then also be assaulted. However, Jack wasn't always gone at this time. Frequently at this point, he would be home and sleeping beside her, but could never seem to wake up as if he was being kept asleep or in a state of paralysis why the events took place. Coupled along these intense and abhorrent manifestations came activity that was plain creepy. Not a day would go by without the family hearing scratching noises coming from within the walls, or deep, drawn-out breaths coming from behind them, feeling the exhale upon their necks, making the hairs on their entire body stand on end. Jack at times after a hard day's work would like to unwind and decompress by watching some TV in the living room. And on occasion, he would fall asleep to whatever was on before eventually waking back up and making his way to bed. However, this night, he found himself awake and coherent but unable to move, as if he was paralyzed or stuck in some kind of a glue trap like an insect. Unable to break free, he glanced around the room trying to discover the source of his distress. It was here that he was met face to face with this being, this demon that seemed to be plaguing their lives. The creature grabbed him from the back and slammed him onto the floor, began repeatedly bashing his head into the hard wood below before disappearing. After this, Jack didn't watch TV to unwind anymore. As a matter of fact, no one could unwind. They were petrified at whatever was taking place in the house. Unable to afford to move between all the adults, and seemingly stuck between a rock and a hard place, scared and unable to figure out what to do, they began to seek help wherever they thought they could find it. It was now winter and the family, besides their daily duties, spent most of their time indoors. While watching TV one afternoon, they saw an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, world-renowned paranormal experts and demonologists. Not being particularly religious and unsure of where to turn, they decided to reach out to the couple and were surprised when they made contact. After speaking with them for some time, the Warrens agreed to come to their house to meet in person with the Smurls and to investigate. And within a week, that's exactly what they did. After an initial meeting with the family, hearing their testimonies in person, and after exploring the home, the Warrens decide it seems genuine and it's worth investigating. And they begin their usual process of bringing in their team for an extended period of time to document and mull over potential solutions for the family. After several months of the documenting team living with the family and experiencing strange activity themselves, such as furniture stacking on top of itself, along with several other previously mentioned happenings, such as the stains and attacks on individual members of the home, Lorraine finally comes to the conclusion, after having a vision within the house, that they were dealing with a total of four entities. One was that of an old woman who she believed was not a threat to the family, but was simply being held against her will within the home. One was a younger woman who was angry and resentful and could be violent. And the other was a man who took the life of his wife and his lover and had been hanged in the same spot a hundred years earlier by a vengeful crowd. The final entity was that of a demon, and this demon not only was strong in keeping the other three spirits under its heel of control, but would use them to strengthen itself and wreak havoc upon the family, to sow discord, anxiety, and fear, all things to which it could feed on and continue to grow stronger. After reaching this conclusion, 
and having gathered sufficient information, the Warren spoke to Father McKenna, who was a Vatican-sanctioned exorcist, and had worked with them over 50 times on separate cases in the past, so he was no stranger to the demonic. But after his arrival and attempted exorcism, the activity only increased in aggression and hostility, and for whatever reason, it was not tied to the home anymore, but rather the family members themselves. Jack began to experience horrific visions of the creature at work, as did his father, and alongside the continued paranormal activity taking place at their home, their daughter Karen fell seriously ill with a fever that the doctors couldn't diagnose at the time, and almost died. Several of the other girls were also visited by the sickening presence at night, as Janet also was and continued to be. The demon also began to physically attack the family more often, causing stinging scratches and cuts on their bodies at random times, as well as deep and bruising bite marks. Still trying to help the family rid themselves of this creature, and fearing for the family's continued torment, the Warrens convinced the Smurls to allow a second exorcism to take place, and McKenna again would visit and conduct a second exorcism months later, in the early spring. During this exorcism ritual, EVPs were recorded, which when played back after the fact, would reveal multiple entities laughing at and berating them for their efforts. Ed Warren would also be choked during this visit and would be incapacitated for multiple days after. Unfortunately, the second exorcism also failed, leading to even more violent manifestations of evil. Trying to get away from it all for even just a few days, the family went on a camping trip to the Pocono Mountains, but the demon would follow them there as well, tormenting them wherever they went allowing for no rest, no decompression, and no peace. Upon returning to their home following this trip and getting even more desperate, they decided to reach out to a local TV show called People Are Talking to see if anyone could possibly help them. They did, however, remain anonymous during their interview, and this call for help, however, went unanswered, but the demon seemed to retaliate against them for it. Janet would once again be hurled against a wall, and Jack would experience something truly terrifying and new. As he woke up in the early morning to get ready for work before the sun had come up, a light rain tapped the glass of the windows outside. As he dressed himself and began to gather his things for his workday departure, he came down the stairs and was greeted by a disgusting and horrid creature. Standing in front of the door was a monstrous being whose head almost touched the ceiling. It resembled a horrible amalgamation of a man and a pig standing upright on two legs. It screeched and rushed towards him, but as he fell backwards onto the stairs, hurting his back, the creature stood over him face to face, snarling before it disappeared. This manifestation disturbed and rattled Jack to his core. The same morning, shortly after Jack had left for work, because although terrified, he still had to provide for his family if they ever wanted to have a chance of escaping this hellscape of a home. Janet was woken up a short while later by a hand reaching up through her mattress and grabbing the back of her neck and pulling her towards it and choking her. After these events, horrific snarling noises, like that of a pig, could be heard coming from inside the walls. The time was now August of 1986, and the Smurls felt that the risk of ridicule did not outweigh the need for their story to reach a wider audience, so that somehow, somewhere, someone could possibly help them be freed from this torment. They would soon be granted an interview with the Wilkes Bar Sunday newspaper, but instead of someone reading and immediately coming to their aid, their home quickly became a tourist attraction instead. The press, skeptics, 
and curious onlookers alike began to visit the house and camp outside of it at all hours of the day and night, with some particularly weird people even coming up and staring into the home's windows themselves. Some of their neighbors who had seen and heard strange things coming from the small residence began to turn on them. They believed that the family was concocting some kind of a story to try and make money. Eventually, however, despite the torment inside and outside of the home now that they were experiencing, the Smurls would be contacted by a medium by the name of Mary Alice Rinkman, who offered to meet with them. Upon meeting the family and walking through the home, it was also Mary's conviction that there were four entities within the house, three human spirits, and one who had never been human, thus corroborating the Warrens' beliefs about the situation as well. She would, however, take things a bit further. She identified the old woman by the name of Abigail, the murderous man as Patrick, and the violent and ill-tempered spirit as Patrick's wife. And the fourth entity, of course, could not be identified by name, but was indeed a very powerful demon. The press coverage, despite the ridicule and the positive acquaintance of Mary, also had pushed the Scranton Catholic Diocese into action as well. They offered to take over the investigation. In the meantime, the Warrens had not given up on the family, but rather had reached out to several more priests and had arranged for a mass exorcism to be conducted with four priests taking part, as well as multiple prayer groups. Alongside this, now Bishop McKenna came in for a third and final time and conducted an exorcism on the house for the family. And fortunately, the ritual, at least for a time, seemed to work, because following it, there were no disturbances for about three months. But as winter set in that year, just before Christmas of 1986, Jack would again see the creature that had tormented him for all of those years. This time, however, it beckoned him to allow it to take over. But clutching a rosary in his pocket that had been gifted to him by the church, he prayed as hard as he could, and thankfully this time, the demon vanished, never to be seen again. However, the putrid smells and violent manifestations would return and continue day in and day out. Frustrated, hopeless, and exhausted, the Smurls by this point had finally saved enough to be able to leave this dreaded duplex on Chase Street and decided they needed the closest thing to a fresh start as they could get. So when they finally did move, they moved to a completely new town, one where the ridicule would not find them. But like the terrible pattern shown before, the demon did not seem to be tied to the property, but rather the family. The activity started back up almost as soon as they had moved in and laid their heads to rest in their new home. It would take some time, but in 1988, the church finally sanctioned a fourth exorcism, but this time at their new residence, and this finally seems to have given the family peace. A few things I would like to mention, however, are these. From my own personal experience and many other stories I've researched, it seems like renovations, particularly on older homes, can wake up dormant spirits or hauntings. Perhaps this is what happened to the Smurls. It's hard to tell if the assaults were one or multiple demonic entities, but if they did truly exist, how did they get in the home to begin with? And my guess is that the collection of negative energy attracts them like moths to a flame. Perhaps they enjoy or feed off of human suffering. This would only make sense to me considering that they hate humans and refuse to bow to them in the beginning. Perhaps once they're embedded in one's life, they continue to sow said suffering to exploit and grow stronger, ultimately trying to take the human's life and their soul back with them to hell. I would also like to mention that scratching on a person and inside the walls, as well as disembodied breathing, are all signs of demonic infestation. And for one reason or another, having actually experienced this personally, seeing the manifestation of a pig-like demon 
or a creature, as well as hearing pig snarling coming from within the walls, is considered to be a serious or incredibly strong sign of a very strong demonic infestation. As far as the initial activity, the seeping through of the stains, the sinks turning on, toilets flushing on their own, and leaky pipes, those initially could be written off as poor skill when the work was initially done. But it seemed like with this story, all of these things were working perfectly fine for months before they all of a sudden, almost at the same time, began to go wrong while costing the family money that they didn't have. And money at the time seemed to be their main issue, as well as the paranormal. So perhaps the demon knew and exploited this to add to the misery it was feeding on. But truly, at the end of the day, the conclusion is yours to make. Was the Smurl haunting legitimate, or just another tale concocted for money, or inside the broken minds of individuals who claim to have experienced it? Let me know down in the comments below. They would eventually release a book about all they had experienced, called The Haunted, in 1988. But financials or how successful it was was never released, at least not from what I could find. But what I do know is this. It's extremely important to examine a situation from all angles just before diving into it. Although a place might seem like a fresh new start, it could indeed be your fresh new hell. And those renovations that you think are going to improve your quality of life could awaken something that has been watching and waiting for a new host to attach itself to and feed upon until it can wear it down rot and eventually drag it back to the depths from where it came from. When you think of the paranormal realm, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it a haunted place, a person who's being tormented by unseen forces, or an object like a doll that has seemingly taken on a life of its own, or perhaps a little of all three and more? But have you considered that a vehicle could be haunted? Considering if objects could be haunted, it seems possible to me that this story may just convince you that something inhabits this vehicle in particular. Something malevolent. This strange tale over the decades has seemed to take on a life of its own, and not only has it been requested, but deserves its very own rendition here on Mystery Archives. This is the haunting story of James Dean's cursed car, and whether or not it continues to plague the lives of those who possess its parts. James Dean, both in the 50s at the height of his fame, and even today, is widely considered a Hollywood icon. Born James Byron Dean in 1931, he was born into a humble background in Marion, Indiana, the only child of Mildred Wilson and Winton Dean. Growing up, he excelled in school both academically and athletically, playing varsity baseball and basketball, as well as becoming an avid student of drama. His efforts would eventually land him at UCLA in 1949 after his high school graduation, where he began to truly pursue his passion for acting. He had first started out as a pre-law major, but would soon switch his major to drama. His first role in college that truly made him consider becoming an actor was when he was selected out of a group of 350 other actors to portray Malcolm in the play Macbeth. Shortly after this, he also began acting in James Whitmore's workshop. Although he loved acting, his father didn't, and his choice of major would soon alienate the two from each other. But refusing to give up on his dreams, James would drop out of UCLA in January of 1951 to pursue a full-time career as an actor. It was during this time that he began to pay his dues, so to speak. First starring in a Pepsi commercial, then landing a series of walk-on roles in various movies such as Fixed Bayonets, Sailor Beware, and Has Anybody Seen My Gal. While struggling to pay the bills whilst chasing his dreams, James also worked as a parking lot attendant at CBS Studios, where he would eventually meet Rogers Brackett, a radio director and agent who offered him professional advice and guidance to assist him in furthering his career. 
Brackett would open a major door for James, a starring role in the Broadway play, See the Jaguar, which would indeed continue to open many other opportunities for the aspiring actor. Moving from walk-on roles in movies to several television appearances, and soon a major role in a major film, he would finally receive his big break in 1953, where he starred in the movie East of Eden. It was here that his complexity as an actor and improv skills were finally able to shine. Almost immediately after East of Eden premiered, Dean would quickly pick up another and an even bigger role in Rebel Without a Cause, as well as another film called Giant following soon after. Rebel Without a Cause is what seemed to make Dean a cultural icon, becoming not only an admired actor to many, but a heartthrob as well to thousands. In 1954, shortly after East of Eden had concluded being filmed, James began to take an interest in auto racing. He purchased several vehicles for the hobby, including a Triumph Tiger T110 and a Porsche 356. James competed in his first professional event at Palm Springs Road Races, held in Palm Springs, California, where he achieved first place in the novice class and second place for the main event. He continued to race and would race at Bakersfield a month later, where he would take first in his class and third overall. Really taking to the motorsport, he hoped to compete in the Indianapolis 500, but his busy filming schedule unfortunately made this impossible. His final race would occur in Santa Barbara on May 30th, 1955. During this race, he was unfortunately unable to finish due to a blown piston. His racing career was then placed on hold by Warner Brothers, the studio in charge of the film Giant, until filming was finished. Dean would finish his scenes, and while Giant was in post-production, with the ban lifted, he decided that he would race again. However, this time, he wanted something stronger and faster. On September 23rd of 1955, James purchased a new 1955 Porsche 550 Spider and brought it to the legendary flim flammer George Barris to have it personalized before his next race. During the customization process, he chose Tartan Seats, the number 130 emblazoned upon the hood, and the name Little Bastard painted on the back just underneath the Porsche emblem on the engine cover. Almost as soon as his car was done being customized, and James began to drive it around. There was a series of omens that should have alerted him that something wasn't quite normal with Little Bastard. Later that day, on September 23rd, James was driving his new car around Los Angeles, where he met up with British actor Alec Guinness to show him his new toy. Almost immediately, Alec became very wary of the car. In his personal diary, he said this in regards to seeing it for the first time, and this is also a summary of what he told James himself in person that day. The sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry, feeling a little ill-tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. I heard myself saying in a voice that I could hardly recognize as my own, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you'll be found dead in it by this time next week. After being told that his car seemed sinister and that he would be found dead in it by this time next week, all James did was laugh. Exactly one week later, on September the 30th, James Dean and Rolf Wutereich, a former Luftwaffe pilot and factory trained Porsche mechanic, were at Competition Motors in Hollywood, preparing Little Bastard for racing that week at the Salinas Road Races in Salinas, California. The intent was for Dean to transport the car via a trailer to Salinas, behind his 1955 Ford Country Squire with his photographer, Bill Hickman. But before it could be raced, the car needed some break-in miles on it to make sure everything was in working order. Rolf suggested driving the car to Salinas to break in the engine and familiarize himself with his new vehicle. He would also ride with him. After having a cup of coffee across the street from Competition Motors at 1.15pm, the group departed for Salinas. 
At 3.30 p.m., patrolman O.V. Hunter said he stopped and wrote Dean a ticket just south of Bakersfield, California, for driving 65 miles per hour in a 55. Hickman, who was towing the trailer, would receive a ticket for 20 miles over the speed limit because he was towing a trailer in which the maximum speed allowed would have only been 45 miles per hour. The crew would then stop at Blackwell's Corner on Route 466 for drinks. Here they also met up with Lance Ravendlow and Bruce Kessler, two other racers who would also be competing in the Salinas Road Races. Once they had departed at about 5.15 p.m., Dean and Hickman drove west towards Paso Robles. A half an hour later, a black and white 1950 Ford Tudor Coupe was headed east on 466. The vehicle was being driven by a 23-year-old California Polytechnical student, a man with the strange name of Donald Turnipseed. Donald made a left on Route 41, and as he crossed the center line, Dean, who was traveling around 85 miles per hour, tried to avoid him. However, despite his best efforts, the two vehicles collided head-on. The Ford Coupe upon the collision slid 39 feet down Route 466 in the westbound lane. Dean bore the brunt of the collision, but stayed within the car. Vuterich, however, was thrown from the spider and was laying on the shoulder multiple feet away from the scene. Upon the arrival of emergency personnel, with Little Bastard completely totaled, they would have to pry James from the mangled vehicle using a crowbar. An unconscious and dying James Dean was then placed into the ambulance, along with a heavily injured Rolf. The closest hospital was 30 miles away, and as the ambulance rushed towards Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital, they too, as if they had been stricken with the worst luck imaginable, would also be involved in a car accident. Despite the horrible circumstances surrounding the initial accident, the ambulance did eventually make its way to the hospital roughly 45 minutes later, and although it would take months of recovery, Rolf would live. But despite the emergency crew's best efforts, Dean, however, would be pronounced dead on arrival at 6.20 p.m. His final cause of death upon autopsy would be determined to be a broken neck and internal hemorrhaging as a result of the crash. He also had sustained multiple broken bones, including his legs, arms, and jaw, as well as multiple severe external lacerations. Donald Turnipseed, however, despite his vehicle also being totaled, walked away with barely a scratch. After his death, James Dean would be nominated for two Academy Awards in 1956 and 1957 for his roles in East of Eden and giant. He would also become the first actor to posthumously win an Academy Award for one in 1956. Seemingly being cut down in his prime at the young age of 24, Dean's death was an unprecedented tragedy. But the story of Little Bastard, despite being crumpled in the crash, would be far from over. A man by the name of George Barris purchased the wrecked Porsche remnants for $2,500 later that year, likely with the intent to host some sort of an exhibit with it and to sell tickets. But after he purchased it, while transporting the remains, upon arriving at his shop, the car slipped off the trailer and broke the leg of his mechanic. Once it was secured in one of the shop's garages, in approximately one month's time, while Barris was arranging for the first exhibit to open, the garage housing the car mysteriously caught fire and burned to the ground. Even more mysterious, upon surveying the damage, the Porsche had sustained no damage from the fire itself. Barris would eventually arrange for a second exhibit, which was held at a local high school in conjunction with the California Highway Patrol, but this showing too was unexpectedly cut short. When the car was surrounded by onlookers and students, it suddenly fell off of its display and broke a young student's hip. Getting an eerie sense that something was off with this car, Barris then began to sell its parts. He would sell the engine to a man named Troy McHenry, 
and the drivetrain to William Eskrid. The two used parts to build cars of their own and had even once raced one another, and both would experience horrendous accidents. During a street race, Troy would lose control of his vehicle, veer off the street, and slam directly into a tree. The impact would kill him instantly. And shortly after Troy's tragedy, William, who was casually driving his vehicle, containing the drivetrain of Little Bastard, suddenly had his wheels lock up for no reason. And upon turning while experiencing this, the car began to roll, leaving him critically injured in the crash. He, however, despite his injuries, would live. While parting out what was left of the car, Barris would also sell two of the Porsche's tires, which had been untouched since the accident that claimed Dean's life. After selling the tires, he also installed them on the customer's vehicle at his shop. However, upon driving home, both of them, not one or the other, but both simultaneously exploded, causing the driver to lose control and drive off the road. They would fortunately regain control of their vehicle and despite being shaken up, were unharmed. George Barris, after selling what parts he could, would continue trying to arrange exhibits for the remnants of the car to be shown. The third and final exhibit that was set to happen was going to be held by the Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council as a traveling display. However, the truck driver who was hired to transport Little Bastard to the exhibit on a flatbed truck a man named George Barkas would be involved in an accident while heading there. He would be ejected from his vehicle and would land to the side of the flatbed. And whether it was a failure of securing the remnants or something more sinister, he would be crushed and killed when the Porsche rolled off the flatbed and onto him. There would be other mishaps as the twisted Porsche would be loaned out to various exhibits across the country in the years to come. But when it was on loan to a safety exhibit in Miami, Florida in 1960, following the conclusion of the exhibit, as it was being hauled back to Los Angeles, the truck that was carrying what was left of the vehicle would once again be involved in a fatal crash, killing the driver. What remained of the Porsche known as Little Bastard vanished from the scene that day, and to this day, all these years later, it has never been seen again nor has any of its parts. Despite collectors and enthusiasts alike willing to put up big money for even a genuine scrap of its remains. But before we speculate on what could have happened to it, I would first like to give my take on the bizarre activity that surrounds this now infamous legend. To me, if there was ever something that could be considered cursed, this once prized Porsche of James Dean very much fits the bill given all that we've learned. But just why would it have been cursed? And how? These are questions that I've pondered while researching this topic. There of course doesn't seem to be a proper answer, or even a real speculated one that would genuinely make sense that I could find. There doesn't seem to be any crazy occult ties to anyone he was involved with, but one theory that I did come across could possibly explain why. But of course this is just a theory, I don't want people getting mad at me. James Dean, besides being an acclaimed actor by the young age of 24, was most definitely a heartthrob with the ladies. It's been rumored that among his various affairs with rich and powerful women, he also had multiple escapades per week. The theory I came across was this. Could it have been possible that some star-crossed lover or fling of Dean's could have placed a curse on him? Curses, of course, like anything paranormal in nature, are subject to a sense of belief in these kinds of things, or so most think. Perhaps Dean broke the heart of the wrong person. With Dean hitting the big time and also taking up car racing in between films or the filming of those films, perhaps one of his girlfriends, rather jealous or heartbroken, or both, placed a curse of sorts on him, either on him or something to do with his newfound love for motorsports. 
how this would have exactly imprinted specifically upon the newly purchased Porsche of 1955 goes far beyond my expertise, but it is the only explanation I could find that would remotely make sense, aside from a horrible string of unfortunate coincidences. And strangely enough, the man who hit Dean, having the name of Donald Turnipseed, Turnipseed, in my opinion, is all too close to turn up speed. It's kind of weird, don't you think? With all of the darkness surrounding this car, Rolf had a very tragic ending as well. Upon his post-wreck recovery, he began to receive horrible letters from James Dean's fans, blaming him for the actor's death. This eventually led to a terrible drinking problem as he felt responsible for what had happened. He would eventually move back to Germany where he experienced many lows, including multiple divorces, and his final marriage, however, seemed to be at the lowest point in his life. Having been depressed for years, coupled with other psychological problems stemming from the guilt of the accident, with too much alcohol in his system, in 1969, Rolf attempted to end his fourth wife. He stabbed her 14 times with a kitchen knife while she slept. Afterwards, he attempted to take his own, but failed. He was, however, arrested and would spend a lengthy term in a mental institution instead of prison. This would also be his last and final divorce. He would for a short time bounce back as both a Porsche mechanic and would also be a racer himself once again. But again as well, he succumbed to psychological issues. Falling back on hard times, in July of 1981, he signed a contract for 20,000 Deutschmarks for a feature in a TV show discussing the accident and the death of James Dean. As he contemplated what he was going to discuss, he would become heavily intoxicated, and later that night, he would crash his Honda Civic into the wall of a residence in Kupferzell. Ironically, like James, he too had to be cut from the wreck and would be pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Now where exactly could the remains of the Porsche have gone? The most likely explanation in my opinion had to have been bystanders who witnessed the crash. And my guess is that perhaps they didn't know exactly what they had, but rather saw dollar signs. This could perhaps explain why it didn't show back up. Perhaps people who owned the parts and or the vehicles with the parts didn't know what they indeed possessed. But what also makes this strange is that they've never shown back up at all. There is one transaxle that was rumored to be from James Dean's car that was found in a wooden box in rural Massachusetts, but from what I could find, it has yet to be confirmed as genuine. It was either that people didn't know what they had, or something terrible happened to them as well, and what remains they did possess or parts that they had put in their cars could have ended up scrapped somewhere, never to be seen again. Although I don't want to persuade you one way or another, with all the strange, dark, and terrible events that surround the Porsche 550 Spider, known as James Dean's Little Bastard, one certainly has to consider that there is something otherworldly or cursed surrounding this case. But is it a curse? Is it something evil? Or is it just a horrible string of coincidences? Let me know down in the comments below. Either way, this is one car I have absolutely no desire to see, let alone ride in one that contains any piece of it. When a family moves into a new house, they discover its gruesome past and are met face to face with a grotesque horror. They must choose to fight or let their ever-growing fear consume them. Will they make it out alive, or will evil triumph? This is the untold story of the terrifying Snydecker family haunting, better known as a haunting in Connecticut. Evil entities, specters of another world that create misery and sow discord to engorge and strengthen themselves. Are they simply figments of the human imagination? a byproduct of the human condition, if you will. This story, as well as many others that have been covered here on this channel, beg the question, do evil beings from another world truly exist? 
I'm not here to convince you either way. All that I ask is that you draw your own conclusions. Because this story, like others, will make you truly wonder just what could be lurking in the shadows. The day is a cold one. Snow drifts down from the sky and covers everything in a layer of frozen powder. But colder still is the life-altering news the Snydecker family has just received. Their son, Philip, has been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 14. And unless something short of a miracle takes place to put the disease into remission, he will die in less than six months. He has already deteriorated from a strong and healthy boy to a ghost of his former self. For Philip to undergo experimental treatments, he has to see a specialist located over 300 miles away from the family home and a hospital located in Connecticut. As his treatments begin, the family soon realizes that the eight-hour daily round trips are unsustainable, not just for the family members taking Philip, but more importantly to Philip himself, who is becoming weaker as a result of the cancer and the radiation. Wanting to do anything they can to lessen the burden and get their son closer to his doctors to give him a fighting chance, Alan and Carmen liquidate what is left of their assets as Alan puts in a transfer to move to another site with his company and into the state of Connecticut. As Alan handles the children at home, Carmen heads to Connecticut to attempt to find a suitable place to live for her family. But with two adults and four children altogether, this isn't the easiest of tasks to accomplish, given their budget. After dozens of appointments and dozens of refusals, the situation was becoming bleak. That was until she happened to drive by another house. As she contemplated what the future held, Carmen happened to drive by a large house with a for rent sign hanging in the front yard. Upon inquiring, she made her way inside to speak with the owner of the property, and although renovations were still taking place, and it would be a short while before the home was ready to live in, she was allowed to take a tour. Almost immediately, she fell in love with the home. Its freshly laid hardwood flooring and inviting interior seemed to call out to her, and with four bedrooms, two upstairs, and two downstairs, and plenty of room for everyone, it seemed like the perfect fit. And more importantly, it was just minutes away from the hospital, which was the primary factor, of course. Fearing that the large size of the house would be far outside of their budget, Carmen decided to cut to the chase and ask the property owner just how much the rent would be, and as if a gift from the universe itself, it just happened to fit their budget perfectly. After a handshake the first day, before too long, the terms are inked, and the family begins to move in. Finally, after all of these months of struggle and worry, they have now secured a fighting chance for some kind of normalcy for the entire family, and an even better chance for their son Philip to beat his cancer. Several weeks later, as the children are staying with relatives, Carmen and Alan begin to move things into the house. Just seeing the home for the first time, Alan agrees that his wife did a great job given the situation and that the house would be a good fit for the family. That was until the couple looked into the basement. A small room was now present that Carmen hadn't seen on her initial walkthrough perhaps one that was being renovated at the time. As her and Alan opened the door and walked into it, they began to notice strange tools that they had never seen before laid out on several tables, as well as a sink located in the back of the room. As the snow falls outside and the whispers of the winter wind make themselves heard, the Snydeckers unveil a hideous revelation. Tucked in the basement of their new rental home, a home that they've moved in in order to give their son a fighting chance against cancer, appears to have previously been a funeral home, one where the dead have been prepared for burial in. And unbeknownst to anyone, some of the old tools and saws were still present now in the room as they come to this realization. Shocked and angry with herself, Carmen initially refuses to bring the children there, especially Philip. 
But after being talked down by Alan, who told her to consider their situation, the fact that they had already signed an agreement, that they had spent every last penny on Philip's treatments, the move, and the rent, that even if it was a funeral home, no one likely died there, and Carmen finally relents and agrees to continue with the move-in process. The two vow to hide the morbid past of the home and its contents from their children. They contact the landlord who removes the embalming and preparation equipment, but leaves several tables and a deep freeze that might be useful to the family. And several weeks later, the rest of the family moves in. As Philip and the other children wander from room to room, examining their new house, Carmen begins to mop the floors to prepare to bring in the furniture to complete their move. But as she fills the bucket with soap and hot water, and begins to mop where the items will go. She experiences an omen of sorts. As she mops from side to side, the steamy and soapy water began to congeal and turn into a thick and dark red substance, like that of dead blood. As the liquid smears all over the hardwood floor, within an instant, as she blinks, things seem to be back to normal. Attributing the bizarre vision to intense stress and exhaustion, she tries to write the experience off and continues mopping. Meanwhile, Philip has wandered into the basement stairwell and begins to descend the stairs. Feeling an icy and cold presence overtake him, the lower he gets into the basement. As his eyes scan the room, he feels an ominous presence staring at him. When suddenly, he hears a voice call out to him from a specific room and this voice knew his name. Scared and unnerved, he makes his way back upstairs and greets his mother in the kitchen. He tells her that they need to leave immediately because he doesn't feel like any of them are safe. Carmen initially wrote off the feelings of her son due to him having his illness, adjusting to a new environment and believing that it was an inner voice, not a physical one that he was hearing. But she would realize that she indeed was very, very wrong. As the days grow more difficult and long, the family began to turn to their faith for guidance. Reaching out to the priest who had married the couple, Alan and Carmen have him pray a prayer of healing over Philip, hoping to assist in his treatment. But despite their best efforts, he is only continuing to get worse. By this time, the entire family has moved into the former funeral home, including the other children, but no one has told the children that it was indeed a funeral home. Philip, unbeknownst to the rest of the family, had figured this out on his own. Carmen would eventually attribute his discovery to him being so close to death at the time. She believed that the veil between life and death had become so thin for her boy that he could see what no one else could and know perhaps what others didn't. Working to provide as best as he could, Alan had long since gone back to work, leaving Carmen to run the strange and new house with their family and sick son on her own. He would be home on the weekends until his transfer was finalized, because despite the horrors of having a cancer-ridden child, the bills unfortunately never stop. As the days progress, the strangeness within the home begins to reveal itself from the shadows. The youngest daughter of the Snydeckers is playing with her toys in her room. As the wind whistles outside, as she talks with the dolls and places them within their dollhouse, a figure grazes the background of her room. When the little girl looks up above her dollhouse, she sees the figure of a woman with pale skin and sunken eyes. Screaming, she races to her mother as fast as possible. Carmen comforts the poor girl, who is shaking as she grips her mother. Wanting to comfort her, Carmen goes upstairs to try and dismiss her daughter's fears. And despite her searching, nothing seems out of the ordinary. Believing that Philip and his brother were playing tricks on the poor child, Carmen angrily rushes to find and confront them. But despite her rage, the boys swear that they never told her the secret that Philip had discovered that neither of them had played any tricks on her whatsoever. 
bewildered, Carmen sets them straight and heads back to the kitchen to cook the family dinner. The only peace for her seems to come at night, when the children are fast asleep in their beds, with the crisp air holding an ever-present moon above their home. Despite believing that all of her children were fast asleep, and with the house being so calm, her boys in the basement room were not getting much sleep at all. The boys are often woken up by the sounds and then visuals of someone or something moving behind the closed door. At first they thought it was simply shadows or their minds playing tricks on them when one or the other would be the only ones awake. But now that it was both of them, they were seeing the exact same thing and experiencing the same exact chill creeping up their spines. The two would then continue to confide in one another, as brothers often do, about all the things they had experienced individually once the bizarre specter had dematerialized. The days grew longer and more stressful as time wore on. Philip was knocking on death's door, and his lack of sleep was not helping his treatment, for the frigid nights brought the icy touch of death and the wandering apparitions of another world into theirs. Soon the boys can no longer take it. They approach Carmen to explain what they've been seeing and that there's been a man in what they now call the lab room in their room in the basement. Carmen, as per usual, whether it was to cope with the mounting pressures and responsibilities of their daily lives or to try and convince them to negate their fear or both, wrote off the boys as having nothing more than overactive imaginations, reminding Philip that he was very sick and this could play a role on him seeing something that perhaps wasn't there. However, that would still not explain his brother experiencing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Another typical day in their new lives, Carmen begins cooking dinner for the family. And up until this point, she hasn't had an experience that she's recognized as anything truly paranormal that wasn't stress-related or something else that she could write off entirely. She had just set all the dishes out on the table for her family, and as she starts to make her way to the deep freeze to grab the protein she'd be cooking for the family's meal, she hears slight movement coming from the dining room. As she grabs and then sets the meat down in the kitchen, she goes to examine what the sound was. All of the dishes are gone, without a trace as if she never placed them down at all. Feeling as if she was losing her mind, Carmen can't so easily dismiss this experience because she knows she set that table. Meanwhile, Philip's younger brother, Bobby, was down in their room. He knows something strange is happening in the house that they can't explain, given the apparitions and the noises the two of them have heard and experienced together, along with whatever their younger sister had seen. But this experience seems more personal. He begins to hear what first sounds like whispers coming from the lab room and sees the apparition of a man behind the closed window door. He can't make out any features other than a general outline and his size. But the closer he gets, the more audible the whispering becomes. And this man, this thing, is slowly muttering the name. Philip. Feeling that sense of terror overtake him, fight or flight takes over the boy, and he quickly runs upstairs where he bumps into his mother. Having just had her own experience, she's not sure what to say to him. So taking his hand, the two make their way to the basement and towards the lab room where the whispers had been coming from. After a tense couple seconds, Carmen opens the door, only to be met with silence. Although she believed in the spirit world, she up until this point did not believe that it could interact with the world of the living. But given what her kids have been telling her and what she's just experienced that very night, she wasn't so sure anymore. She had to consider the prospect that her house may just be haunted. Alan would arrive the following morning to spend the weekend with his family. At the same time, a winter storm began to set in. As he arrived. After speaking with his wife and knowing that Philip has made the other children aware of the macabre past of the home, 
He finds it important to address the issue as a family, believing that the information could perhaps just be adding fuel to overactive imaginations. At the breakfast table, he does just that, finally addressing the family that they indeed were living in an old funeral home, but that there was no reason for the children to be scared, that there were no monsters lurking in the shadows, and no specters of otherworldly beings watching them. Although Philip and his brother argue that they've seen and experienced the same things, and they have indeed been very real, they are once again dismissed. Alan would then pull Philip aside to ask him that despite the entire situation, with him being the oldest, if he could please set an example for the rest of the children and not scare them with ghost stories. Philip's cancer treatments continue day after day slowly draining the remaining funds the family has left. Meanwhile, he continues to see and experience even more paranormal happenings within the home. His mother attributes this to his illness and the interactions between his body and medications he's been placed on, despite knowing that her other children, and even herself, have had their own experiences. Another bizarre development recently has been that most, if not all of the family's crucifixes that have been placed all throughout their home have started to go missing with no indication as to where they could have gone. The nightly disturbances have also become regular by this point, with Philip and his brother seeing the man in the lab room ever more frequently, as well as hearing and seeing other apparitions circling them as they lay in their beds. This night, is no different. The boys wake up their parents screaming in terror that the man is back. But after sweeping the house and ensuring that everything is locked, that there was no way anyone could have possibly gotten in, Alan, being very wary of being woken up almost every night, forces the boys to go back to bed, again dismissing their experiences. Tired of not being believed, the boys began to leave the lights on in their room and talk amongst themselves to comfort one another as they would slowly but surely begin to fall asleep. Convinced that Philip was seeing things due to his medication and then influencing the younger children, his parents requested that he be examined for any possible interactions by his doctor. And after a series of tests, the doctor would conclude that nothing Philip was on could be causing such things. The only other possible answer was a psychological problem alongside his cancer. Alan was now picking up every hour he possibly could, as well as any side work that presented itself to try and keep up with the mounting debt the family was being buried in. On any given day, a two-inch stack of bills, either late or termination notices, could be found on the kitchen counter. While sorting through them, he was shocked to find an electric bill, almost twice its average. To him, the children sleeping with the lights on because of ghost stories was not only causing them to lose sleep, but now was costing the family money they simply didn't have. So to counteract this, and of course feeling as if he was justified in doing so, he goes to each one of their rooms and removes all of their light bulbs, except for one. At night, however, the lights that used to make them feel protected and bring them relief would soon contribute to a new supernatural horror. Sleeping in their room in the basement, the Snydecker boys are suddenly woken up by the flashing of their overhead lights. Glancing to find the source, they see their little sister flicking the lights on and off, and despite there being no light bulbs in their sockets, they are still flashing on and off. Running towards her, the youngest brother chases her up the stairs, but she's just too quick for him to catch her. Instead, he runs into his parents when he exits the basement door. But strangely, his mother explains to him that she's been asleep in her room for hours now, and she would know because she had tucked her in and had been near the basement ever since. Not believing her at first, he rushes upstairs to soon find her fast asleep in her bed. He is now even more freaked out, because whatever this thing was could take the form of a family member. Meanwhile, 
As his brother comes to terms with this hideous revelation, a voice begins to call to Philip once again from the lab room, waking him up. Getting sick of living in fear, Philip finally decides to confront whoever or whatever has been calling out to him and approaches the room. Upon opening the door and stepping inside, he is met face to face with the entity that has been calling his name. The apparition appeared to him as a man with dark, red, almost blood-filled eyes, began to whisper to him things about the home's past. After this freezing winter's night, Philip began to undergo a radical change in personality. He began to pull away and isolate himself from the rest of the family, insisting that he be left alone in the basement and that his brother Bobby move upstairs making Bobby feel alienated from their once close and confiding relationship. Despite these personality changes, a miracle seemed to take place, one that the family had been praying for since the very beginning of their struggle. After months of daily treatments, Philip's blood labs finally came back normal. His cancer was in remission, but surprisingly, he almost doesn't seem to care at all. Later that evening, as the family prepares to celebrate the good news, they also welcome a guest for the first time since they had moved. Their niece Teresa would be temporarily living with them and had just arrived from New York. Her parents had been separated and undergoing a messy divorce, so to help her make the best of the situation, they've allowed her to stay with them. Not having seen the family in quite some time, Teresa begins to get reacclimated with them soon notices that Philip, who she had previously been very close to, was missing from the party. She would eventually find him in the basement and also notice that something was very different about him. He seemed darker, more angry, and not at all like the boy that she used to know. He would eventually confide in her all the paranormal activity he and the others had experienced in the house, its past, and that his parents did not believe them. This made him feel extremely isolated and alone, and that the activity had not simply gone away, but had continued to get worse each and every night. His experiences as he explained them to Teresa ranged from scratching on his door and inside his walls, to his name being called, to seeing the apparitions of figures surrounding him, hearing whispering and also seeing and hearing a man in a suit with blood red eyes call out to him and that this man would also visit his bedside every single night and tell him things that his parents had said about him, negative and terrible things. He would then encourage Philip to take action and to hurt his own family. Shortly into her stay, Teresa began to observe that the hatred and malice that was dwelling within Philip that seemed to make itself a part of the family's daily routine. Fights and screaming matches soon became a daily occurrence, especially between Philip and Alan, with Alan seeming to resent Philip for the family's financial situation and for Philip feeling isolated and not being believed about what he was experiencing. According to Philip's diary, every night when he was trying to sleep, this creature, this demon, would visit him and push him harder and harder to commit unspeakable things. It got to the point to where Philip wouldn't even leave his room. He wouldn't argue back against this entity. And day after day, night after night, it pushed for him to hurt his family. Philip would continue to confide in Teresa that alongside this, he began to see other people within the basement who were dead and buried as if they were trapped there by the man in the suit with the blood red eyes. And this entity would continue to threaten to do things to Philip if he did not listen and do as he was told. While explaining these newer developments to her, without warning, he suddenly attacked her, grabbing her arm, trying to harm her. Breaking free and rushing up the stairs and into the arms of her uncle Alan, She watched Philip essentially be exiled back into the basement, and with that, 
their relationship began to disintegrate. Upset at not only what had happened between her and Philip, but at the strange behavior and dysfunction that was taking place within the house, Teresa wept in her bed. She would eventually be gifted a rosary by Carmen, who believed that it would help comfort her, and she wore this to bed that night as a necklace of sorts. However, she would quickly discover that instead of comfort, this holy object made her a target instead. Fast asleep, Teresa was suddenly woken up by the sensation of her blankets being pulled from her body. She opened her eyes to find Philip staring at her with a crooked smile just before he attacked her, striking her several times in the face. Her screams thankfully quickly warranted Carmen and Alan, who subdued Philip immediately. Philip, after this unpredictable series of incidents, was then removed from the house due to his violence. Upon the arrival of law enforcement and medical personnel, he seemed to have no recollection of what had taken place and was screaming and crying as he was being forcibly removed from the home and sent away for a mental evaluation. Alan and Carmen, after securing the rest of the children in the house, followed the ambulance to the hospital to sign the necessary paperwork to have Philip committed for the evaluation. But just before he was led into the hospital, he issued an ominous warning to the both of them. He said, Mark my words, now that I'm out of the house, it'll be after you, and it will get worse. Shattered by what had taken place, the Snydecker's somber drive home turned into a long one, given the distance and the weather that they were braving. By the time they arrived back home, it's time for Alan to head to work. After dropping off Carmen, he departs for the day, Wanting to sleep, but too stressed to, Carmen sits on the edge of her bed, crying and contemplating what her son had said. What if this all truly was real? What would they even do? Where does one begin to fight something they can't see? She decides to head down into the basement, to Philip's room, to see if she can experience anything whatsoever. After several minutes, despite not seeing anything, she does begin to feel a massive drop in temperature, so low to the point to where she can see her breath. She also soon begins to shake with fear that she can't describe. Fighting these feelings, she issues a challenge to whatever could be lurking there, to show itself, to prove that it was indeed real, that it truly did exist. But despite her challenge, and waiting half an hour, she sees nothing. So she heads back upstairs to her room to take a shower to try and relax herself enough to sleep. Meanwhile, Alan had been driving in the dark heading to work for the day. During his drive, he was worried about his son, his family, and leaving them behind for the day in such a raw and emotional state. But he would have no way of knowing that these weren't the only problems he had to worry about. After his long drive, he finally arrives at work for the day and begins. He hopes to be distracted from his lack of sleep and family problems. As Carmen runs her shower and the rest of the children sleep, a horrific presence begins to manifest within the house. As she's washing herself, the shower curtain suddenly covers Carmen's face, catching her off guard, out of breath, and begins to smother her. At the same time, Teresa is startled awake. She's being strangled by the rosary she's wearing. She screams, pulling at her neck, and eventually frees herself from its stranglehold. She then runs towards the muffled screams of her aunt coming from her bedroom. Seemingly having no other choice after seeing her being strangled by the shower curtain, she pulls it off of her as fast and as hard as she possibly can. The two then share a moment of sheer terror and trauma, both having experienced things that they can't explain. However, unbeknownst to the two of them at home, Alan is about to experience an attack of his own. While working at his job site, he begins to hear his truck turn over, despite his keys being in his pocket. Glancing out to figure out just what this could be, he watches his truck begin to move towards his small work building, and then as if someone had their foot on the gas, 
it began to accelerate to a high rate of speed. And before he could run out of the way, the truck smashes directly into the building and straight towards where he was standing. Back at the house, Carmen and Teresa are still in shock when suddenly the phone rings. However, there is nothing but a muffled laugh coming through from the other side. Feeling a burning sensation on her ear, Carmen immediately drops the phone to find that it's partially melted. Starting to scream, she finds herself frozen as she glances towards the ceiling after she sees something out of the corner of her eye. Teresa then sees it as well and begins to scream. A black cloud of some kind now floated above them. The two are absolutely mortified by these sudden and horrendous manifestations of supernatural evil that are taking place and realize that Philip was right. This force, this demon, has taken over the entire house. Running out of the room and frantically into another, they rush to gather the rest of the children, but with a snowstorm raging outside and a demonic storm raging inside, they seemingly have no escape. Carmen is unsure of what to do. She then receives another phone call, this time picking up another landline in the home. It's Alan on the other end. He explains just what had taken place and that he was waiting for the authorities to arrive. Even more shocked and scared now that this entity has now attacked all members of the family and has left the home and attacked Alan as well, since all the events seem to take place roughly during the same time frame. She's convinced that the demon will follow them wherever they go to try and escape it. So although it is the middle of the morning during a winter storm, she makes a phone call to the only person who she thinks can help her in this desperate situation. She calls the priest who had married her and Alan and had blessed Philip before his cancer was in remission. Thankfully, for their sake, the father picked up on the other end and promised to head to the home as soon as possible. Given the road conditions, it takes him several hours to arrive, but thankfully, he does. First things first, the father wanted to speak with Carmen and figure out just what exactly was taking place. And after discussing anything and everything they can think with him, hoping for an answer to fix their situation, albeit it's never that easy, the father's response leaves them stunned. He tells them that he does believe them, but if that they simply ignore the presence and what it's been doing, it'll go away. This is the first time her faith has failed Carmen. She's bewildered by his answer. How can you just ignore something that's tried to take your life, your family members' lives, this very day, alongside everything else that has been building up to this point? In her opinion, she couldn't. So once he left, she rushed to seek other, less conventional options to find the answers that she desperately needed. While digging through a phone book and multiple newspapers to try and find anything she could, she stumbled across an article about a husband and wife team of so-called demonologists who were set to give a lecture at a nearby university. After several additional phone calls, she makes contact with Lorraine Warren, which after discussing the prospect of the visit with her husband Ed, agreed to come and visit Carmen that day to evaluate her situation. After their arrival and a brief interview, Lorraine starts to survey the house using her gift of discernment, a supposed extra sense that allows a person to discover the true nature of a situation, a person's character, or in this case, a spirit or haunting, whether it was something good and godly or something grotesque and not of God. She is almost immediately drawn to the basement, with no knowledge of the home prior. She makes her way towards the notorious lab room and soon begins to sense a plethora of beings. A sense of horrible depression and doom began to fill her entire soul. Among the many human spirits she felt, she felt something else, something sinister and sickening. There was a demonic force dwelling within the basement. She would later describe the feeling as if there was a doorway to hell itself located in that room. 
to remove any such spirits within the house. The Warrens informed Carmen that the Catholic Church would have to authorize an exorcism and send the appropriate personnel to make this happen, a process that could take weeks or even months. To try and expedite the process, the Warrens contact their lead researcher, a man named John Zaffis, to come in and document anything and everything that could be found so that a proper report could be submitted to the church. John, along with his crew, temporarily move into the home to try and document anything that they can find that will help prove beyond a reasonable doubt that an exorcism is indeed needed to be performed to help this family. During their time there, they relied on video, audio, and photographic evidence to document their findings. At the Warren's advice, so that the demon could not isolate any one person in the family, the entire family moves their beds into the living room to sleep together at night and protect one another. Thankfully, with the researchers also temporarily living there, at any one given point in time, there was always an additional person with the member of the family. However, with Philip gone, the entity begins to pursue the next most vulnerable person. Having suffered intense stress from the entire situation, given that her son was in a psych ward, her family dynamic was in tatters, and the bills were forever continuing to pile up. That person was Carmen. Carmen was also stricken with an overwhelming sense of guilt for not believing any of her children, especially Philip, about what they had experienced during the entire ordeal. And it seems like perhaps the entity exploited this within her, for all that it was worth. As the family discussed potential findings with the Warrens, as well as their researchers, around their fireplace in the living room, Carmen was suddenly flung backwards. As everyone gathered around her, their faces switched from those of concern to horror, as her throat began to bulge and swell, and her face began to contort and twist. She would later describe what she felt while experiencing this. She said, I felt as if I was in a dark hole, like a well, surrounded by black figures who I couldn't make out their features. I felt pure despair and hopelessness to the point where if I stopped breathing, I knew I deserved to. Rushing to her aid, but not being qualified to perform an exorcism themselves, the demonologists and their crew asked for the rest of the family to bring anything sacred to her to be placed upon her. Teresa rushes to find the rosary that she was gifted by her aunt, the same one Carmen believed would protect her. This was placed upon her in an effort to combat whatever was attacking her. After hours of praying and pleading, the group's prayers, along with the rosary placement, seemed to work, at least temporarily breaking whatever spell Carmen was under. As she came back to waking life, she had no idea how long she had been out of it, and the rain warn told her that she had been under attack for the last eight hours as they had prayed over her. The experience seemed to last mere minutes to Carmen, yet they were the longest minutes she had ever experienced. It took several more weeks, but eventually the researchers, alongside the Warrens, were able to attain enough evidence in their view to provide the church but they too, just as the family by this point, were beyond worn down. At night, they slept on mattresses alongside the family, all together in the living room, around the fireplace. Their mattresses would breathe an alternating breath to their own, not only waking and scaring them, but behaving as if they themselves were living, breathing creatures being laid on. Although they had researched and dealt with dozens, if not hundreds, of paranormal cases, they believed what they experienced in the Snydecker home in Connecticut was by far the strongest demonic presence they had ever come into contact with. Close to what was supposed to be the final night, head researcher John Zaffis made the mistake of leaving the safety of the living room when he was suddenly woke up out of a sound sleep. He went and sat in the kitchen unable to go back to sleep. Within minutes, he felt as if he had been placed in a freezer. All the warmth quickly left his body, and he began to see his own breath hang in the air. Having experienced this before, he knew he was being targeted. As fear began to overtake him, 
He began to call out to anyone and everyone that was sleeping, just feet away in the living room, but was met with no response. He rushed to the living room where he began to see the mattresses breathing, but everyone who laid upon them was completely unresponsive. He then hears the basement door creak open. As he slowly walks to where he can see the entrance to the basement, he sees a man wearing a suit with a contorted face and blood-red eyes. The experience terrifies John so much to the point where he runs into the living room, shaking his crew awake and telling them that he has to get out. Having only spoken about the situation a handful of times since then, he would go on to say, I have never, in the decades upon decades of investigating the paranormal, experienced something to that degree of evil since that night, and I pray I never do again. Days after John vacates the home, the Warrens finally manage to convince the Connecticut Diocese to grant the family a priest to determine if an exorcism would be granted. Exorcism in the Catholic faith, especially these days, and even so in the 20th century, are only conducted in absolute secrecy and are extremely rare to be granted. Evil must be proven to be present beyond a reasonable doubt through a variety of methods. And rarer still is performing an exorcism on a building or place rather than a person. A priest by the name of Father Frank soon arrives to execute the church's orders and conduct an investigation on their behalf. Having viewed the evidence given to the church by the Warrens, he also listens to the Snydeckers about their experiences and tours the home. By the end of the interview, the family cannot tell if the father will be for or against advising the church to grant them what they so desperately believed they needed. Several agonizing weeks would go by until word was received from the church, and to the family's relief, they decided to grant them an exorcism. Another priest, by the name of Father Richard, was sent to conduct the ritual. Upon arriving during an exceptionally bad snowstorm, Father Richard is almost immediately drawn to the basement. As he descends the steps with Carmen behind him, he turns to her. His stone face, which has been relatively void of emotion, turns into a grimace, almost as if he sensed that there was something truly evil lurking within the shadows. Within seconds, he asks to step into the labyrinth and to close the doors behind him so that he may begin. As he starts to flick droplets of holy water into the space, the energy in the house seems to become darker and the air heavier. Despite feeling a malevolent presence surrounding him, Father Richard continued with the ritual. He went from room to room conducting the exorcism and exalting God's blessings until finally he was in the living room in the presence of the Snydecker family as well as Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now several hours in, as he was making his way towards the ritual's conclusion, the demonic presence that had plagued the family all of these days since they had first arrived at the beginning of this harsh winter in Connecticut refused to be ignored and was ready for a fight. Seen by everyone present, all objects in the room that weren't nailed down or being sat in began to shake and be thrown. Books, knickknacks, statues, and ornaments shattered as the snow and ice slapped the windows outside of the house. The more they prayed, the more they seemed to provoke the entity, and the more intense the activity became. Amidst the turmoil, and again witnessed by everyone, Teresa is lifted into the air by what she would later describe as massive, unseen hands, and is choked. It seems as if the entity is attempting to shock and break the prayers of those present, but Father Richard refuses to give in. Then, within the blink of an eye, it was as if whatever had been stalking the walls inside of the Snydecker home was gone, and despite the mess that now surrounded them, they could not be more relieved or thankful for their newfound freedom. Several days after the exorcism, they started the process of selling the house not only to try and put their past experiences behind them 
to move forward, but to also not take a chance of the door that they believed they closed with the help of their faith being reopened and reigniting their own personal paranormal hell. Philip would be released from the mental hospital about a month later after the exorcism had transpired. He not only seemed to be in stable condition, but appeared much healthier and was truly happy to see his family again. His cancer, thankfully, would never return. What happened in the Snydecker home is open to interpretation. Those who believe them believe the exorcism to be a resounding success, while those who don't believe see it as some kind of attention-grabbing hoax. The Warrens themselves back then, and even now long after their own deaths, continue to be polarizing figures, with some believing them to be legitimate demonologists and paranormal experts, with others believing that they were charlatans, nothing more than profiteers of people's fears. As stated in the beginning, I'm not here to convince you one way or the other. My job is to provide as many details as I can of what happened with the particular case, and the rest is up for you to decide. Some additional details I would like to add, however, are these. After investigating the home, the Warrens did launch a large media campaign promoting the home as majorly possessed. Whether this was for good or bad intentions, I can't say, because I simply don't know. Philip, unfortunately, would later develop a drug habit and would also later be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Whether this was a result of drug use or something that was there all along, we'll never know. But it did not appear to be his condition prior or even after his stint in the mental hospital. The story would go on to inspire a dramatized documentary with altered names of the family and with hidden interviews of the family in 2002 known as a haunting in Connecticut. It would then again be popularized in 2009 when the horror film The Haunting in Connecticut was released. Upon moving out in 1987, the Snydeckers did not experience any other paranormal activity in their lives, and subsequent owners of the home say they haven't experienced any activity either. This is perhaps due to the successful exorcism of the home, or the demons simply existing within the minds of those involved. Again, the interpretation is up to you. But part of me still wonders, could hell still be locked away within the basement of that house, watching, lurking, and waiting for the right person to stumble upon its locked door and to pry it open again? Could the blood-red eyes of the demonic man in the suit still be lusting for more souls? If so, this is one door I pray stays locked for good. If the walls of certain homes could speak, some of the stories they would tell would more than likely shock and amaze us, or perhaps repulse and terrify us instead. This is one such story that if a house could tell its own tale, it would certainly be one we would never forget. A family moves to the country in search of peace, but those dreams are soon shattered by supernatural terror. Something evil lurks within the woods outside of their home, and this evil begins to stalk and wreak havoc upon everyone that dwells within the home. Can they save themselves before it's too late? This is the untold story of the haunted Hinsdale House, also known as the Dandy House, and the entities that infested it. Hinsdale, New York, a small town with a rustic and rural charm, tucked deep into the countryside and far away from the crime, concrete, and smog of New York City. Instead of gazing at skyscrapers, they would rather gaze at the surrounding mountains, covered in dense foliage. But these mountains and their surrounding woods harbor many secrets and have many stories to tell. This is just one of them. The year is 1970, and the Dandy family is in pursuit of their American dream. After years of vacationing to Hinsdale and the surrounding areas to catch a break from their fast-paced life in Buffalo, they've finally reached a point 
where they can turn their vacation into their daily life. Seeking their own rural paradise, they come across a listing for a home that seems idyllic for their family and its needs. Clara Dandy, the mother of the family, believed that they all got along so much better in the country, like it had some form of redemption qualities about it that seemed to rejuvenate their spirits and their relationships. As they wind their way through the countryside, they lay eyes on the home for the first time. They are not only taken aback by the beauty and the sheer size of the house, but that it sat upon eight acres of land, surrounded by dense and breathtaking woods. Clara would describe her feelings about first seeing the house as being overcome with a deep sense of peace. It was like I had finally come home after years of being elsewhere. And the air, the air was like breathing champagne. It was wonderful. The home is over a hundred years old and still had most of the original and ornate woodwork intact. It just seemed to emanate charm and elegance. As the children explored the nearby woods, Mr. and Mrs. Dandy continued their tour. But when they were being shown the storage space underneath the stairs, the door was initially stuck. But after some elbow grease from Mr. Dandy, they were finally able to get it open. It revealed a dusty space of sorts with a fireplace, and one that didn't seem to fit the feeling of the house at all. Clara would describe her feelings towards the space like this. I wasn't sure why, but I felt very uneasy when we opened up the storage space. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was dark and desolate, not at all like the rest of the house. But she quickly would dismiss these feelings, attributing the creepy factor to her city upbringing and the fact that they didn't have storage rooms like that where she was from. After closing the space and continuing to evaluate their opportunity, the feelings of peace would return, and the dandies decide that they can't resist the charm of this rustic, hundred-year-old home, so they decide to purchase it. Once things are squared away several months later, they move in to start their new, rural existence. On move-in day, Clara's brother decided to lend a helping hand had begun to move things in hours before the family was able to arrive. When loading in a box of belongings, as he opened the door, he was greeted by a flurry of insects. Both bees and flies pelted him in his face. Rushing past them and then unloading the box onto the floor in the main room, he was startled to see hundreds of dead bees scattered all over the floor, and even more startled to see hundreds still alive and coating the windows. It was still cold during this time of year, and although he too wasn't from the country, he found it rather odd that there would be any kind of infestation at this time. When his sister and her family finally arrive, he greets her with the news, and in order to continue with the move-in, they have to call an exterminator. Upon his arrival, he too confirms the oddity of the situation. He said that he had never seen so many bees and flies in one spot in a home, and given this time of year, it was not normal for them to swarm or infest anything during this time. It takes some time, but after he finishes clearing them out, the family is finally able to get moved in. As time progresses, things seem to fit the dreams they had for moving there in the first place. The family finally seems at peace. They were getting along better and enjoying each other's company, a far departure from their city life in Buffalo. But as the old adage goes, if it seems too good to be true, it is. A few weeks into living in what they believed was going to be their rural paradise, their son Mike has met and made friends with a nearby neighbor. Together, they begin to explore the woods surrounding the dandy property. As the two navigate the forest, they're startled when they hear the crunching of leaves directly in front of them, stopping frozen in their tracks. And fearing that it could be a bear, they take refuge behind a large tree and sneak glimpses from around its sides to figure out just what it could be. 
to their shock, they spot a boy not much older than them, carrying a rifle and walking in the path ahead, yelling at the boy that this is private property and wanting to know what he was doing there. They run towards him and try to catch up to him. They again freeze in their tracks when they notice that not only is the boy transparent the closer they get, but half of his head is missing. As the figure continues to walk and taking deep breaths, they slowly continue to follow him. The three approach a small lake and within the blink of an eye, the boy vanishes. Mike and his friend are at a loss for words and have no explanation for what they saw. They quickly rush back to the dandy house as fast as they can to tell anyone who will listen to them. They soon make contact with Clara and explain to her what took place, but she's quick to dismiss their experience as nothing more than overactive imaginations. Another several weeks pass by and Clara has all but forgotten about what her son had told her. She's now walking the family dog Madison in the woods for some fresh air and exercise. As they get deeper into the forest, Clara starts to hear what can only be described as chanting. As she stops to listen, it sounds eerie and disembodied, as if the sound is all around her, but has no true origin. It's at this time that Madison begins growling and barking. The longer she seems to focus on the chanting, the louder it seems to become. Madison by this point is losing her mind and breaks free from a distracted Clara and bolts in the direction of their home. Clara chases her down and she finally stops running when she makes it to the front door of their estate. After taking a moment to collect herself, Clara then calls her husband who, like she was to her son, is quick to dismiss her feelings, thinking that she just had to adjust to rural life and wasn't used to it being so different from their life in the city. Frustrated and worried now about what the chanting could have been, Clara talks with her son about her experience while she prepares dinner for the family. Mike thinks that it could have been some campers at a nearby campground, not too far from where their property line ends that could have been the cause of the strange sounds. To try and put his mother at ease, he and his friend Matt once again take to the woods to explore this possibility. As they venture further into the woods to a lookout point towards the campsite, they see nothing. There are no signs of any campers that could be nearby enough to have caused such a noise. Even more perplexed now that there was no explanation the boys start to make their way back to the house, when suddenly, they hear what sounds like an axe thudding into a tree right next to them. Unsure of what that noise could have been, before they could even begin to ponder or investigate, they hear a woman screaming to their left. This frightens them so bad that the two young men run as fast as they can all the way back to the dandy's home. When they arrive, Mike is truly scared this time. He has no way of explaining his mother's experience, or any of his own either. Upon relaying this information to Clara, both of them are left beside themselves, now with a chill up both of their spines. But these weird events thus far would only intensify as the sands of time continue to trickle into the hourglass. It has now been months since the initial experiences, and besides the oddities they were, the family's life continues to be great. This distance from the experiences only makes them ever easier to dismiss in the minds of Clara and Mike. One day, Phil, or Mr. Dandy, decides to take the children Mike and Tina into Buffalo for the day to get some errands done. Mostly being a homebody, Clara decides to forego the trip with her family and relax at home, reading her latest book instead. When her family departs, Clara finds herself curled up on the couch and immersed in her latest story as a warm breeze drifts through the open windows of the house. As she reads page to page, she is suddenly startled 
when the window closest to her slammed shut. Upon investigating, it makes no sense to her because the breeze was light, not forceful at all, and their windows were fairly new, which made it all the stranger. But as she always does, she dismisses the happening as nothing more than a weird coincidence and heads back to her book. Several nights later, as Mike lay asleep in his bed, he is suddenly woken up when a nearby box of a chess game drops onto his chest. A storage shelf is directly above his head, so opening his eyes, he glances up to see if perhaps it could have been hanging too far off the edge, causing it to fall. And to his shock, he begins to see several more boxes slowly shifting towards the edge by themselves. The lowest one then suddenly flies out from the rest and smacks him in the chest. Terrified, he sits up trying to catch his breath. He has no way of explaining how the lowest box could be pulled and thrown with such force without bringing the rest of the boxes with it, as if someone or something had grabbed and thrown it by a will of its own. Calling out to his mom in the darkness, she soon arrives in the doorway of his room. Being a very science and logic-minded person, Mike has no way to explain what has happened. Examining the pile, Clara too is perplexed and becomes just as scared when another box from a different pile flies across the room causing both of them to scream in terror and run out as fast as possible. Trying to make sense of what was taking place, Clara fears that whatever could be lurking in the woods has been stalking her family and has slowly but surely, like a malignant stain, invaded her home. As her fears turn into a revelation, Clara decides to reach out to a local priest for help hoping her faith will help her come up with some answers, and better yet, some solutions. She speaks with a priest named Father Alphonsus at the University of St. Bonaventure. He believes that the activity could be a poltergeist, but given the intelligent nature of how it seemed to be behaving, Clara has her doubts, but nonetheless wants an expert's opinion and assistance. So arrangements are made for the father to come out and bless the home, and after several days, he arrives. On April 13th, 1975, the cleansing begins. As the family and the priest were all gathered together, and as he began to speak, a series of horrible wailing and moaning noises began to fill the home, as if the house itself was crying. The scent of burning matter also quickly enveloped the house. The activity reached a fever pitch when the priest opened and began to pray over the crawl space that was underneath the stairs. But after this, a blissful silence overtook them all. It was as if whatever entities that dwelled within the walls of the dandy's home had finally been evicted. Within time, the father gathered his things, exchanged pleasantries, and departed for the evening. The family now believed that their darkest days were behind them, and for all intents and purposes, that seemed to be the case. But as if to mock the Holy Trinity itself, three months later to the day, all hell would break loose once again. That night, while her husband is away on a business trip, Clara finds herself woken up out of a dead sleep by a series of knocks coming from inside the walls. The knocks themselves are soon accompanied with whispers from someone that she can't see. As she apprehensively makes her way from her room and slowly down the stairs headed towards the main level, the apparition of a young girl begins to walk by the stairs. She slowly makes her way to the crawl space, opens the door, and closes it behind her. Clara is baffled at the sight. After gathering up her courage, 
She too makes her way fully down the stairs into the crawl space. And after a moment of bracing herself, she opens the door only to be met with nothing. Clara then makes her way to her daughter Tina's room to make sure it somehow wasn't her and perhaps her nerves were just on edge. But after opening her door, she finds her fast asleep in her bed with no signs that she had been awake for some time. The following morning, while the rest of her family is still asleep, Tina wakes up to begin her day. As she feeds her pet bird in its cage and begins to brush her hair in her oval mirror, she notices that her bird isn't doing its usual whistles. As she glances over at them, she finds it staring into the corner of the room. As Tina glances back up at the mirror, she's met with the apparition of a young girl. Her face is sunk in, and her eyes were gone. She screams in terror, and just as quickly as it appeared, the apparition disappears. The screams of her daughter startles and quickly summons Clara to her daughter's room. As she consoles Tina, she realizes that the priest's blessings were ineffective. She quickly calls Father Al back and explains what had taken place the previous night and that morning. And although he is busy, he promises to come back as soon as possible and this time to bring a paranormal expert with him as well to help him determine the cause and hopefully find a working solution. He's able to come back the following week. In the meantime, Clara is determined to keep her family calm. If she can control her own emotions, she knows that everything else will be okay. As they wait for the priest to return, Clara tries her best to keep her family calm and live some sort of a normal existence. That weekend, her and Phil are watching a movie while Mike and Tina are out with friends. As they enjoy their time together, their happiness is quickly shattered by a huge crashing noise coming from outside of their house. Quickly grabbing a flashlight and running outside to investigate together, they quietly step towards where they believed the noise to be originating from, when suddenly they hear it again. But this time, thankfully for them, the origin is not paranormal. This time, with several raccoons who happen to be foraging through their metal trash cans for something to eat. Relieved for that moment, they start to make their way back to the house when they suddenly see the figure of a young girl in their living room window staring at them. As they rush inside, they run up into Tina's room where they find her incoherent and staring into her oval mirror. They try to get her attention, but she's entirely unresponsive. Her pale blue eyes are black. Panicking, they shake her and yell her name not knowing what else to do, when she eventually comes back. In that moment and later, Tina will not recall how she got home or what exactly happened. As the family tries to gather themselves from the shock of what had just taken place. They hear movement coming from Mike's room. Phil tells his family not to leave Tina's room as he rushes to investigate. However, the home phone begins to ring. It's Mike. He's asking if he can stay the night at his friend Randy's house. However, when told what was going on, he quickly tells her that he's coming home to help in any way that he can. Rushing to his car, Randy offers to come with him, to which Mike agrees. Randy would later recount that Mike's hands were sweating and he was shaking, gripping the steering wheel. He was pale. I asked him what was wrong and he said that things were happening at the house that he couldn't explain. The boys quickly arrive to find the family in chaos. Phil is prepared to do battle with whatever force is within the house and the girls are staying close to one another, attempting to comfort each other. As they try to determine a course of action, all the lights in the house go out. 
they then began to hear banging and scratching coming from the crawl space. Flashlight still in hand, Phil with the backup of his family shines the light towards it and begins to make his way towards whatever this thing is. It seems like with each step he takes, the sounds become louder, and after a tense several seconds, he opens the door to the crawl space. Inside, they find that the fireplace that was once there has been completely disassembled. Its bricks have now been stacked in an elaborate pile directly in the middle of the small room. The amount of effort and strength required to perform such a task convinces all of them that whatever they're dealing with is strong, persistent, and perhaps uncleansable. Nonetheless, with their spirits waning, Clara makes a desperate call to Father Al, who agrees to come earlier than originally planned, and makes emergency arrangements for himself and his paranormal expert of a friend to come out that night. They arrive as soon as possible. The paranormal expert is a man by the name of Alex Tennis, a well-respected paranormal researcher and psychic whose abilities were studied at the American Society of Psychic Research. Together, they make their way to the door of the Dandy House, hoping to help rid this family of whatever seems to be stalking them. After being let in, the family quickly leads the pair to the crawl space to show them just what they were talking about. Although he was aware that some sort of activity was taking place, Alex had not been given any additional details or information in regards to the home, its history, or happenings. As he steps into the crawl space room, he begins to have a vision. In his vision, he sees multiple dead bodies stacked within the crawl space itself. After the vision subsides, Alex begins to explain to the family what he saw. He believed that many had passed away within the home itself, some of natural causes, and some of murder. It was his conviction that based on what he saw, that the house used to be a stopping point for a stagecoach, or perhaps some kind of inn where people would stay the night before departing the following morning. It was also his belief that there was a nearby criminal or gang of criminals that would often rob and kill nearby travelers, and that perhaps these souls somehow became trapped here. When someone passed or was found dead nearby, being the only stopping point in the area, their bodies would be placed in the crawl space until they could receive a proper burial. It was also his belief that there were seven different spirits that were trapped within the home altogether. With this revelation, the family, Alex, and the father pray that the trapped spirits within the home find peace and be released, so that they may go on to their final destination. Upon the pair's departure, Clara once again has renewed hope. The home as it did the first time around seemed to be cleansed and to be more peaceful. Meanwhile, Mike and his friend Randy were skeptical of Alex's conclusions. After he left, they used an old map of the area to trace where he had said the old stagecoach route was. They did indeed find what they believed to be an old trail that could have been used for such a thing, and the trail passed right by the dandy home. But during their search, as they were following the trail out and headed back to the house, they experienced strangeness of their own. As they began to trace the trail, they began to see what they described as orbs of light in the nearby trees, and these orbs began to come at them. Randy, having never seen or experienced anything supernatural before, began to have a panic attack. Upon arriving at the house, they were fortunately able to get him calmed down. By this point, it was late in the night, and the entire family needed to try and get some form of sleep in order to function the following day. Randy ended up staying the night since he had rode with Mike. Once everyone else was settled down for the night and fast asleep, Clara sat by herself, weeping. She felt that her and her family were helpless in the situation, and that all efforts had been exhausted and that they needed to move. The only problem was that all their money 
every last dime had been sunk into the house, leaving them stranded. She would continue to contemplate the future and would cry herself to sleep that night. The following morning, as the family began to wake up and start to try and resume some form of normalcy, Mike went ahead and departed with Randy to take him home. Several hours would go by, and Mike hadn't returned. Finally, there was a knock on the door. It was a police officer. He informed the family that there had been an accident, and that they needed to head to the hospital as soon as possible. Rushing into the car and to the hospital, the Dandy family wondered just what had happened. There had been no mention of Randy by the officer at the time. Upon arriving, they were briefed that Mike had lost control of his vehicle and crashed into a nearby ditch. He was now undergoing emergency surgery. He had extensive head injuries, a ruptured spleen that may have to be removed, and that he had lost a very significant amount of blood. As they waited for the outcome of their son's surgery, the dandies were once again greeted by the officer who had knocked on their door. He explained to them that Randy had indeed been dropped off and that Mike had wrecked on his way back to the Dandy residence. But as he was being loaded into the ambulance, he kept saying that there was another person in the car with him. And although they believed him to be confused on account of his injuries, they went ahead and searched the area nonetheless, but another person was never found. After two weeks of being in a coma, Mike finally wakes up but unfortunately has no recollection as to what exactly happened to him to cause the accident. Clara, however, believes that whatever presence that's been plugging their lives had to have been responsible for what happened to her son. After months of recovery for Mike and continued paranormal activity within the home, Father Alphonsus would return with Alex one last and final time at Clara's request to try and rid the home of the evil and persistent force that had drained the life out of all of them for years now. However, this time, just the father and Alex would perform the cleansing inside the home themselves. As they moved from room to room, Alex would once again experience multiple visions of the past. His visions would tell him that of the seven spirits who he believed to be within the house, One was that of a young man who had been in some kind of a war or battle near where the property sits now. Another was that of a young girl who had passed from some sort of very painful illness in what was now Tina's room. And there was another spirit that seemed to be keeping herself and others trapped within the house. It was the spirit of a woman who was incredibly angry and resentful. She continued to be possessive depressive, and just as angry in death as she was in life, refusing to pass on. Believing what they had identified to be the source of the paranormal activity, Father Al decided to take a different approach to the cleansing itself. Although an exorcism cannot be performed on a place, but rather has to be performed on an individual, the rites themselves could in theory be performed or added to a series of prayers to try and use their strong cleansing powers to clear out a home such as this one. So that's exactly what the father did. He began to perform the rites of exorcism within the house itself. As the prayers began to exit his lips, varying with intensity as the rites often do, the home began to literally shake, and the horrific moaning and wailing that had made itself present in the very first cleansing seemed to return with a vengeance. Every horrible feeling, banging, knocking, and scratching noise that the family had experienced thus far was present and seemed to be magnified. It takes hours, but eventually the rites are finished. As the dust settles, so to speak, the home seems peaceful and blissful, like it did when the family had first visited and decided to buy the home. And again, for three more months, the family lives in peace. But like the persistent force that has manifested itself to be, the haunting begins again. The Dandy family, despite their best efforts, 
simply cannot take it anymore, decide to cut their losses and move. Unable to find a buyer for their house, they eventually declare bankruptcy. Shortly after this, Phil and Clara would also divorce, bringing a sad and bitter end to what was supposed to be a rural redemption for the Dandy family. However, this wouldn't be the end of the story of the Hensdale house. Eventually, the home would come into the possession of Daniel Klaus, who currently owns it. Daniel is a renowned paranormal investigator and has been involved with the likes of Nick Groff and has made appearances on tons of national TV programs centered around the paranormal over the years. Having been raised in a haunted house, this led to a lifelong fascination with the paranormal for him. After years of restoration, it is now available for both investigations and tours and is still considered a very active paranormal portal and is kept open as a paranormal research location. It's even staged in the 1970s period to maintain the integrity of when the hauntings were initially known to have began. But now that we know the backstory of the 20th and into the 21st century of the Hensdale house, just who owned it, what happened to them, and who owns it now, I would like to shift your attention to some of the plausible theories as to what could have caused the haunting. Many theories of what could have caused the haunting have been formed over the years by the many people who have researched and have been interested in the case. One theory is that the home was built on top of an Indian burial mound. This of course could have disturbed the spirits of the natives that rested within the land, and although tribes who used this method of burial were present in the area back in history, there is little to no evidence to support this claim, but perhaps any evidence by this point could have long since been lost to the sands of time, or could have been removed when the home was initially built. Another theory is that the home was at one point used as a stagecoach inn, and passerbys were murdered either near or within the home itself, leading to their spirits being trapped within the home or on its land. Although there is evidence that a stagecoach route did run very close to the home, there isn't direct evidence that the house itself was used as an inn, but it is possible. Murders also did take place in or around the area in which the home is now located, which could lend credence to the theories of criminals robbing and murdering people along the stagecoach route. An old family from the area that used to own the home, with the last name of McMahon, also lends credence to the home being used as an inn at some point. The now past grandfather of the family used to tell stories of a road that passed by the house where stagecoaches traveled. Another theory is that one or several of the spirits were trapped as a result of hangings that took place there. The now famous hanging tree that sits near the residence was indeed used for executions for a time. Most famously, it seems, was the execution of a woman named Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was pregnant. Could this perhaps be the spirit of the woman who was angry and refusing to leave? Other events, such as a homicide that took place in the year 2000 near the house, as well as a buzzsaw incident that led to a boy's death, have led many to believe that whatever haunts the area could indeed still be there and influencing our world. It's important, in my opinion, to try and get the story and the facts as straight as possible, not only for the current owner's benefit, but for the dandies who have suffered greatly as a result of their story becoming public, especially towards the end of their time at the property, as word got out that something strange was taking place at the house. A local paper ended up reaching out to the dandies for a statement, Thinking that they were accepting an opportunity for additional outside help, they gave their story, only to be met with ridicule from the paper, which in turn led to ridicule from the public and nearby residents, which this combined with the paranormal torment they were experiencing, along with then having to file bankruptcy and then later divorce. In my opinion, they suffered greatly and did not benefit from the story, especially during that time. 
The only benefit I've seen could be from Clara Miller, formerly Clara Dandy, who would eventually write a book known as Echoes of a Haunting. But to be fair, if I experienced even a portion of what she did, I would eventually write a book to catalog what happened as well. Not only for some monetary benefit, of course, but for my own sanity, really. So as I've began to mention, and will continue to mention again in the future, if you ever encounter anyone mentioned in this video or any of my other videos, whether it be in person or online, please be respectful of them and their experiences and do not ever harass anyone. And if you find yourself seemingly handed an opportunity that seems too good to be true, the answer to your prayers, it's more than likely not the case. It could be a nightmare waiting to happen. It could be a haunted home infested with entities, sitting and waiting for the perfect victim. Don't let it be you.